Welcome back. Uh, on this journey of entrepreneurship that I'm on and that several other people who watch this show are on, one of the things you know you start to learn about is what can you write off and uh, how can you save points on travel and how does this business card work, this travel card work, how do these points work, how does this affect your credit? And it just becomes like a specialty in, in and of itself. The further I've gotten into this, this is not something that I would have ever known that I was interested in before, but the deeper I've uh, gone down this rabbit hole, talking to my accountant and guys who have millions of points uh, traveling all over the world. When I talk to, you know, Ty Lopez or Dan Fleischman or Bulzarian or whoever, like there's all these things that I'm not really aware of. So uh, today we have two experts in this one area of travel hacking and which credit cards to use. Uh, Eli Facenda is a former college baseball player. He's currently living in Austin, Texas, Hook'em Horns, and Tommy Longergan, is this it Long, Longergan? L Lonergan. Lonergan. Uh, he's a former executive chef, and he's been to 50 countries before he was 30. He is currently homeless, or home free. He lives <laughs> in one hotel after another. Uh, and the two of them got together three years ago and started Freedom Travel Systems. And I'm excited to have, thank you guys for coming on uh, the show here today. Thanks for having us. Well, yeah. You guys came from Thanks Phoenix from the uh, Waste Management Open. Mm -hmm. You know what I love about waste management? This is the greatest thing. Uh, people are sitting there. At, it's the bougiest. Uh, uh, it, it, it's the bougiest golf tournament in the, in the country. Like it, it really is. Like no, there's no place where people are big dicking the, each other more than that golf tournament. <laughs> it is because uh, was it hole 14 or 18? Which one was it that has like the arena around it? 18 does. Is it 18? Yeah. You go there and it's just like everyone is trying to show off to everyone, and you've never seen anything. And then you, you nobody's. Ask like what is waste management? The the porta potties that you guys take dumps in when you go to festivals, that's waste management. Dump trucks, like that's what they do. And so whenever I hear people like chase your passion, I'm like, if you can chase your passions, that that's fine. But if you can solve someone else's problem, like Wayne Heisinga did with waste management, then you become a billionaire. And so that's what I love. I always use waste management. It's like, do you think Wayne Heisinga woke up one morning and was like, I want to clean shit? I want to like clean people's diapers. Like, how can I create a business to do this? But instead it made him billions of dollars and he ended up, you know, buying the Miami Dolphins. So so that's that's a really interesting thing. You guys were there. It's a lot. It's probably the best networking golf tournament of the whole country. You know, we can't get into Pebble Beach. You know what I'm saying? So it's a, yeah. we're we're not going to Augusta. So it's a little different. Um, so yeah, that, that's uh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, for, so for you guys for the travel hacking, I wonder if you guys could go through your story specifically. Uh, you started. You were playing baseball, and then you you started to help teams be able to travel a, a more inexpensive yeah. way? Yeah, yeah, so my, my story with travel started actually through baseball. I was a high school baseball player, went on my first ever international trip to the Dominican Republic, was this 16 year old from like a relatively affluent area seeing nothing down there. I'm like, holy shit, what, what is this? I'm, so I'm, I was really curious about the world. I then spent my 20s building an international sports travel company where we would take youth sports teams all over the world and basically set them up in international tournaments. And through that, learn the whole points and miles and credit card game because we were using a lot of credit cards and our company and I was basically broke at this point and I was like, I don't want to wait 20 years to have the lifestyle that I want. I want to figure out how to do it now. So I figured out this whole points game to optimize travel for me to save my company money and then realized, holy shit, this is an opportunity to help a lot of other business owners that have so much confusion and misunderstandings around how credit works, how business credit works and how points work. And so that was kind of the, the genesis for me. And then we connected through the gram. I was looking for other people that were in this space that were cool. There's a lot of people who are in this world and they're great, they're really crafty with it, but I was like, I want someone that's like a, you know, it's basically gonna be a bro with me here. And yeah. we connected and I was like, this guy's got the sauce and he was way beyond my capacity of actually doing this, so we linked up. Have you guys ever seen Justin Ross Lee? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's we're, a, we're buddies. Yeah, so he's a buddy of mine, he called me uh, two days ago. And he tells me, but his travel hacks are different from your travel hacks. His travel hacks are like, call the front desk and complain for an hour until they upgrade you into another suite and then yeah. say that the pillow was on backwards or some shit. And he, <laughs> and it did the stuff he, and I've been with him when he's done it before. And it's some of the craziest stuff I've yeah. ever seen. There's lots of layers to the yeah. travel hacking. Yeah. Piece, but uh, I'm actually taking a flight with Justin in a couple of weeks here yeah. uh, from Abu Dhabi to London. So I'm sure that'll be a... That should be pretty fun. Yeah, man. He's uh, he's one of my favorite people to interview. Anyway, so uh, talk about your story, uh, an executive. First of all, how did you decide that you wanted to become an executive chef? Was culinary something you were always interested in? Yeah, you know what? I got my first job, little mom and pop Italian restaurant back in high school. And you know, I was delivering pizzas, washing dishes, and I just kind of found myself venturing into the kitchen. And I'm like, you know what? I like this. This is fun. This is cool. I never was in a million years where I was like, oh, when I grow up, I'm going to be an executive chef. It just kind of naturally happens. So sure. ran that all through high school, uh, went to business school and college. I was working at Ruby Tuesdays yeah. to learn like the corporate structure, high volume, like natural business behind it. Um, but essentially graduated college, didn't want to do the, you know, go downtown Chicago, get the suit and tie, the office job. I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. 
Uh, packed up my car, no job, no plan, nowhere to live. Wound up in Vail, Colorado. I had about 2000 bucks to my name and I'm like, you know what? I want to at least like ski for a season, like just, you know, enjoy that kind of ski town life. And uh, got hired as a cook at the hospital up there. It was like maybe 16, 17 bucks an hour, but enough to pay the bills. I'm like, okay, cool. The executive chef who hired me never saw him again after the interview and they offered me his job two weeks later. So at 22, I got hired as an executive chef. And essentially my six months in Vail, Colorado ended up being my entire twenties. I had an awesome job. I got to help people. I got to, you know, get a hundred days a year on the mountain. Yeah. And then I got the travel bug during all this stuff. Yeah. So, um, Essentially, I wanted to travel, but I didn't want to impact the work-life quality balance. It was like, man, I'm working 40 hours a week. I get to ski. How can I afford to travel without taking a second job? Like, there's got to be, I'm missing something here. So I took a trip with some buddies down to Nicaragua, and that just kind of opened up. I'm like, I want to go tomorrow. Like, where can I go next? But the bank account was looking pretty, pretty slim after that. So enter in the world of credit card points. And I just started just going down the rabbit hole and just educating everything from, you know, starting with credit. I had to fix my credit up from college. So mm. I was like getting my credit right. Started learning about the cards and the points. And then you start talking about elite status and all, you know, there's just so many layers to this thing, but I just dove down the rabbit hole. And essentially I was able to leverage my sub six figure salary into hundreds of thousands of points a year, which was turning into two or three trips that I would have never been able to afford yeah. otherwise. Yeah. So that's just kind of the name of the game, but essentially all the twenties, exec chef, 50 countries, obviously started to fly some businesses in first class, yeah. uh, some cool redemptions along the way, but really just kind of mastered that craft. And uh, yeah, that next series was basically, I got to, how can I make a living out of this? How can I help other people travel too? I was uh, a captain in the Air Force and I flew to a lot of countries, maybe not 50, but I flew to a lot of countries. Some countries we're not allowed to fly to anymore. Yeah. Uh, and um, and I, I didn't, I mean, it wasn't first class travel. I'm in the cockpit. Uh, <laughs> we had coffee, that's about it. Um, but we, but doing that, I did that for a long time. And, you know, if I wanted to go somewhere, I'd fly class A on like some, you know, C-17 strapped in loud as shit, having to wear headphones. And so when I get on like Delta or United, I'm like, this is just easy. You know, it's like, Luxury, what you, baby. You, <laughs> you guys, like there's one of the things uh, you, people don't think about. Um, I believe it's 14,000 feet cabin pressure is out cabin pressure altitude. It may be less, it may be closer to May eight. I don't remember what it was when we're in the air force. Sometimes we put on mask and our cabin pressure altitude was always higher than it is for the commercial flights. I don't know why they did it probably because you have a bunch more people in the back, but it sucked, man. It really not, not having oxygen sucks. I'm just, <laughs> just letting you know. Uh, that's, and that's one of the reasons to be fair. I'm just telling you my story. I don't really look to travel as much anymore because I've been, you know, to a lot of places. And I just, I get off and my back hurts and it's just like, man, I sat mm -hmm. on this flight. I uh, went to South Africa once and it was 27 hours and I was like, man, this is just brutal. Like, I would just remember spending the first day and a half recovering from the trip. And then every time we'd go to Iraq, it was like, it was at least 24 hours to get there. And I remember it was just, it was just rough, right? And then the other issue I had with traveling was when I go to Los Angeles. Well, it takes me an hour, I gotta go to the airport to here in Vegas and then the flight's an hour. And then it's an hour to get my bags. And then it's another hour to get to my airport. I could just drive. You know what I'm saying? And so that was one, another issue. But I had never, the point was, I never had a credit card ever for anything. I had paid off a house with cash. I had paid off a car with cash. I never had a credit card. And then my two business partners told me to get the Chase Sapphire Reserve. So I'll go off and get that uh, card. And then I put everything on this card and I pay it off before the end of the month. It's supposed to pay off on mm -hmm. the 28th or whatever. Um, and then I started getting these points and I was like, oh man, this is probably going to be like, I got to spend 50 grand to get like one trip. And it wasn't, it was like, actually I got pretty decent deals, but you guys, I, I want to know from you guys, obviously mm -hmm. I'm doing level one shit. You guys probably have way more advanced ideas on how to do this. I heard you say, don't spend your points immediately. Uh, there's different, like there's actual travel cards as opposed to cards that are for points. Some cards where you get four points for food, stuff like that. And could you guys go into this, uh, starting from a, a, you know, an audience that probably isn't that mm -hmm. sophisticated in this topic. Sure. Cool. Yeah. I'll go kind of high level. So yeah. Tommy's really, I mean, if you want to get into the technical stuff, like yeah, when I was building this, I was like, I want the expert of experts. Yeah. So when it comes to breaking down specific trips, like yeah. he's got the sauce like nobody else. But from a high level, there's really three main things you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's maximize every dollar you spend. Yes. So spend on the right cards, put the right things in the right cards so that every time you spend, you're not leaving money on the table. Mm. The second piece is get the highest value out of the points. So there's different ways to use these points. 
And what most people do is they completely just like flush them down the toilet. They're cashing them out for gift cards. They're going to Amazon. They're mm. going through what we call the travel portal. And there's ways to take these points where instead of a point being worth, typically it's worth one penny, you can get five, sometimes 10 or 15 times that. And we'll give some examples as to what that means. So I should not be going just through the Chase portal to book stuff? No. Okay, good. Good to know. Yeah. So there's a rare case where that would make sense, but typically okay. no. The third piece is going to be just to maximize those perks and benefits. So you're talking about travel kind of being a pain in the ass, which, which it can be, right? And you know, regardless of, of uh, if you're traveling in first class or not, sometimes you're going to get jet lag. That's an unavoidable circumstance. Sure. But if you get a lounge, you get free champagne, you get yeah. priority boarding, you get no lines, you get comfy seats you get baggage, you know, all that stuff Yeah, it makes it a little bit easier. So yeah. upgrading those lifestyle perks is a big one. So those are kind of the three buckets that you want to break things into. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Tommy can break it down pretty extensively, but I think the thing that most people miss on, particularly business owners when they're starting out is the first piece, which is they need to have the right cards and they don't even know the difference between how does business credit work versus personal credit? Yes. And why do I need to get business credit cards in the first place? So if you guys could explain that, let's just let's just use uh, an example of a company that makes 50,000 a month, yep. okay? And has maybe four or five employees. And the employees have to travel on regular, uh, uh, a regular basis to do either make content, do podcasts, or go to conventions mm -hmm. or whatever. But let's just say this is all just business travel. Yep. What, what, card should, what are the things they should be looking for? What cards should, should they be getting? Yeah, well, in this scenario, we just kind of hit the nail on the head where it's, hey, you know, what is the business and, you know, what are, what are our expenses? So it sounds like in this, you know, example, majority of our expenses are going to be travel. Yeah. So the, the idea is, okay, well, what's the card that's going to earn me the most amount of points for travel purchases? So the idea of just like, I don't know, picking apart your your expense sheet and looking for those items where the biggest spend is. So let, let me break, let me go back even yep. one level. Am I getting a travel card to pay for travel or am I getting a travel card to pay for other stuff and then I get travel points? Well, at the end of the day, all of our cards, uh -huh. regardless of what we're buying, we want to be earning those travel points, yeah. right? And the idea is, you know, we need to have points to spend them. Sure. So, uh, you know, ideally we're going to be using points or excuse me, using cards to earn points. So if travel is one of our biggest items, that's going to be like kind of a priority in terms of what card should we be bringing in that's gonna maximize our points earnings for travel. So I'm sure there's gonna be several other types of expenses, but I would say, hey, you've kinda of got two options here. One would be like an American Express business gold card. That's gonna earn us 3X on a lot of our travel, 4X on a couple of other categories. One more time, am I spending with this card for travel or am I spending it for hamburgers and then using the points for travel, or is it both? Essentially both. Both, okay, I mean, got it, got it, yeah, I understand. Yeah. So it's using those, you know, a couple of cards that, you know, we are going to focus all of our spend. So any type of travel, mm -hmm. you know, very broad travel category, that's going to be your go-to card where every time we're buying something, that's the card we're using. Okay. We'll be accumulating points from all those, all those purchases, which in turn will then use those for travel at a later time. You know, we got to earn those first, but an Amex Business Gold, awesome card for travel. And then there's also a Chase Inc. preferred card. Yes. It's very similar where that earns like three X is a very broad travel category. So what you've just done now. Are, are these attached to the business or are they attached to individual people? Are there certain cards that can only be attached to a business? What I'm asking. Yeah. Well, essentially, you know, yes, it's attached to the business, but it is still, you know, attached to that person individually yeah. too. But the idea is like, you, you're going to have cards that are personal cards, mm -hmm. but then you'll also have business cards. And we want to try our best to keep these things separate. Just okay. To keep got it, it. Just to keep it clean on the backside. I mean, you can use personal cards for and business. So but the Chase Inc, the Inc means like incorporated. We're looking for businesses specifically to go the, whereas like the Chase Sapphire Reserve is for personal. Is that e correct? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Right. And just with that scenario, let's just say you having that Chase Sapphire reserve card. Yeah. Having that card is actually going to make all of your Chase Inc points more valuable. Okay. So some of these cards, personal business, there's going to be supplements to one another. So, you know, the banks want you to have multiple Chase cards, you know, Amex wants to compete with Chase so that, you know, they're kind of playing the game there. But the idea is targeting that top spend areas, what cards earn me the most points and the types of points that I can in turn maximize for travel down the road uh was it felt to me like when i was growing up that amex was dominating this arena and, mm -hmm. and then the other cards have come up with something more yeah uh, i think of american express before i think of chase but mm -hmm. people recommended that i get a chase card so what what who are the biggest players in this arena so there's there's a lot of players when it comes to general banking but being clear on like your outcome is yeah. the most important piece because there is 
this whole aspect of how do you get business credit and funding to scale yeah. for like a person who's starting a business and trying to grow. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. But when it comes to the point side, there's really four main banks that can do this whole like transfer option. So, so we, that would transfer between business and personal. Transferring your, so what I want to say transfer, this is kind of like the key to the whole system that we're talking about. Okay, got about it. Right here. So this is transferring your credit card points from the banks into airline and hotel loyalty programs. Oh. So that's, that's how you get what we call Instead we call it, of using the portal. Mm, got we it. We call that exactly. travel arbitrage. Yeah. Because the hotels and airlines price differently than the banks do. So you can convert and get these whole different sets of values. So there's only four banks that offer that option. And it's Chase, City, Capital One, and Amex. Okay. Now, Chase and Amex are the two main players. Capital One will be third, City's probably the fourth. Um, so when you start out, you're thinking, how do I get the most of these types of points in those cards? It's kind of like thinking, if you were like, if I was gonna give you 100 Mexican pesos or $120, you'd take the dollars all day because you know the difference in the value. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that the points aren't the same. So be like, oh, I'll take the pesos. It's like, well, that was a pretty dumb move. Be right? because, because of the cut that, the, that Chase is gonna take facilitating your travel, whereas if you give it directly to uh, the airline, then you cut out the middleman. Somewhat. So the way that it works is like, when you go through Chase, mm -hmm. they're what's called an online travel agency. Yeah. So you redeem their points. You're, what you're technically doing is you're cashing your points into Chase and they're just buying you a ticket. Okay. okay. Yeah. When you convert them into airline miles, the airlines will say, hey, when you fly from the US East Coast to Europe, it's this price in points. I don't care if the, the cash cost doubles or not. So if you go through Chase, whenever the, the ticket price changes, the number of points, points will goes change. Up. Yeah. With airlines, it doesn't necessarily work like that. It's like region based or distance based. They all have their own what's called like an award chart. Wow. Okay. It's almost like buying commodities where you have a set price between, exactly. yeah. between the, uh, the, that's uh, a great analogy ex for expiration it. of yeah. the, yeah. yeah. So for people who know, uh, one of the ways that airline company airlines hedge against the, the changing of oil prices is they buy oil contracts. So if the price of oil goes up, they make money on their, on their oil commodity contracts, like, uh, four slash CL, I believe is one of them. Uh, and when they do that, it offsets the additional cost of, of the price of oil. So they take any excess cash and they use it to buy oil mm -hmm. commodities. Yeah. Um, so in this, in this kind of situation, so you would get a set price, uh, regardless of what happens, you know, there's a, a huge party or something that goes, mm -hmm. everybody wants to come to CES or the, the concrete show sure. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. I got, I understand that point. And then, uh, you would, what, which just very basic here. Am I going on the bank's website and then pulling my points over from mm -hmm. Chase? How does that work? Yeah. Yeah. So you'll just go into the site and there's always going to be a section that says convert points, transfer points. So, so I'm going to go to American Airlines site and then transfer my points you, from Chase. You go to where the points originate. So you'd go to like the Chase website. Okay. I go to Chase. Yep. Okay. Got it. And you have to have a loyalty account set up for where you're going to transfer it. Okay. So let's say that this, there's so many layers to this. So, yeah. so we don't have to get into all of that, but yeah. like, let's say you're going to fly on American Airlines you might actually be converting your points to British Airways because they're partners mm. and British Airways prices things cheaper than American. Okay. So you might take your Chase points, your Amex points, you log in, you click transfer points, you put in your British Airways loyalty number, you click convert, and then they show up in your British Airways account. And then you're gonna log in there and search for the American Airlines flight to book it. Okay. So that's like A to Z kind of the steps on the fundamentals of like how the process works. And then which airline to use, which situation, that's like a whole layer of nuance. And that's why we have a brand and a business in the space. Of course, man, I couldn't even consider like trying yeah. to figure this out on my own, but yeah. just yeah. like understand. Cause yeah. that, that was the next thing I was gonna say to you is like when you, you were talking about, I believe $20 million you've saved uh, from in travel in the last few years, and then how you first got this started. What are what is the average person? If you guys could explain the delta to me, what is the average uh, person doing wrong that you guys are doing right? Like where is your your mm -hmm. edge? Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of pieces I see, you know, we talk to people every single day of, you know, hey, what are you, you know, what are you currently doing? I yeah. think the biggest piece is, you know, we talked about the different types of points and miles. There's these transferable points that we're, that we're harping on, but then, you know, they've got airline miles, they've got hotel points. So I think the, the biggest thing is you see so many people swiping everything onto an airline card. Yeah. Or for example, a Delta card. So essentially what that's doing is, hey, we are earning something for every time we swipe, right? Yeah. But if I have a Delta card, all I'm earning is a Delta mile. Mm. I'm driving down the Delta lane. There's no turnoff. There's no other way to use it. I've got a single currency. Mm. Well, if I have a transferable point, let's say I've gotten a, you know, an Amex card. I'm earning Amex membership reward points. Let's just say there was a weird scenario where it made sense to actually transfer my Amex to Delta. You could do that. Or now I'm driving down the Amex lane and I can take 20 other different routes of with course. these points. So I think, you know, well, you, you have more options with the points, but also does Delta then not give you as much for your points because they realize there's only one avenue you can go down? Well, and so that's the next kind of layer. So with all these, you know, 
transfer partners, the airlines, the hotels. And don't think of it as the airline you're flying. Think of it as the airline's award chart, mm. okay? All of them are going to be unique in how they go about pricing their, say, hey, it's this many points for this kind of flight or this many points here. The way that Delta prices all of their you know, flights for miles, they charge an insane amount of points. I and mean, we're talking like several hundred thousand miles to go business class to Europe. Mm. Well, you could fly Delta from the States to Europe by booking it through Virgin Atlantic, who's mm. a partner of Delta. So it might be 375,000 Delta miles, or I could book that same flight for 50,000 miles by booking it through Virgin Atlantic and pulling my Amex points over there. So I'd, have, I'd be on my Amex website and I would go into what you said, the loyalty program specifically for Delta, mm-hmm. or in this case, you said Virgin Atlantic. They're, they're, mm-hmm. they're, I didn't know, did Delta buy Virgin from, so from there's Branson? kind of like a, I'll try to say that in the simplest way, but you know, there's the partners that these banks have. Yeah. So the, you know, Amex, Chase, they've got all these airline partnerships. Yeah. The second layer to this, and like I said, there's lots, we've got the airline alliances. Mm. So kind of going back to like Eli's scenario where he's talking about American Airlines and British Airways. We can't transfer Amex or Chase to American Airlines because they're not partners. Yeah. We can transfer them to British Airways. Got it. British Airways is part of the One World Alliance with American, Qatar, Cathay Pacific. So what that means is you can basically book a flight on any of those partner airlines. With your British Airway miles. Exactly. Got it. So it's kind of like a second tier of partnerships. You know what this reminds me of is uh, when you use a VPN to change your location and you get different prices on uh, Tamu and what's the other place called? Uh, Wish yeah. and, and sometimes mm-hmm. on Amazon like or uh, audible.com. There are certain books that are not licensed to sell in certain countries like in the United oh. States, but they'll build le- license in other countries. Mm. And if you set your VPN to another country, you get a different discount. This kind of feels like the same thing. Instead of doing that, you're just not going to America. You're doing British Airways. Uh, mm-hmm. Are there any other, what, what are the other big alliance? Like if I wanted, so my family was from Colombia. If I want to go to Avianca, mm-hmm. right, uh, in Colombia, is, are they partners with anyone? Yeah, yeah, so that's kind of like that next piece. So whether it's Amex, Chase, we're going to have multiple avenues to mm-hmm. book this Avianca flight, right? Yeah. So, you know, Avianca is a direct partner with Amex. Okay. So if I find a flight that's available on Avianca, I could pull my points right to Avianca. But Air Canada is also part of the Star Alliance. Mm-hmm. They might price that exact same flight cheaper than Avianca. Mm. So there's that next layer of not only, you know, can I transfer my points, but hey, where's the best place to send them? Because in a lot of scenarios, there's gonna be multiple airline programs to actually book this through. So I would say just off the top of my head, you would be able to book a flight down there through Air Canada, Mm. I think cheaper than Avianca, just because of how they price those flights. So it's kind of like there's a second, let's say this, the the more layers you peel back on the redeeming side, the more value that can essentially be Un- uh, unlocked. Got it. Got it. So you might jump on a, a you know, uh, Air Canada, Vancouver to Denver. You jump in on Denver and go back to Bogota. Well, so like I said, so don't think of it as um, the airline you're actually going to fly. You know, okay. we're really just worried about the airline program. So I'm Got saying it. Air Canada. Eli's saying British Airways, but we're going to be flying on their partner. Yeah, we're going to be flying on it. Avianca. So just like Alaska Airlines is now part of Virgin and stuff exactly. like that. Okay, mm-hmm. got it. Exactly. Yeah. So like I said, so don't, when you hear some of these airlines, mm-hmm. don't think of it as... I mean, most of my flights, I rarely am actually flying the airline that I'm booking, you know, through. So I'm Got rarely it. flying United and booking through United. It might be I'm flying United, but I booked through Air Canada, or I'm flying American Airlines, booked through British Airways. Yeah. So that piece right there, that that helps further increase the value and, and really max out uh, these points. What What is the difference? Am I getting a different? number of points if I do the same flight and it's personal or business? Do the do the airlines treat it exactly the same? Yeah, the, the way that you want to think about this is like if you're a business owner, whether you're spending on business cards or you're spending on personal cards, the points go to you as an individual. Mm. Okay, so they okay, don't, got it, got they it, don't got go it. to the company or got anything it. like that. They go to Michael Sartain as an individual. You'll then use those points at your own discretion. It's better, like if you're someone who has personal travel and business travel, I know you mostly travel for business, so. Uh, yeah, I don't travel at all for anything other than business. So, yeah. so you're in a kind of unique scenario. I'd yeah. say there are some people that are in the same boat, but most, most have some personal travel. Yeah. Because of the tax implications, it's better to use your points for personal travel first. Let's say you were gonna take, let's say someone just got married, right? And they're gonna take a $50,000 honeymoon, yeah. African safari, they're gonna fly Emirates first class with a shower on board and a bar, like we yeah. send people on that all the time. Okay, so if you were gonna use after-tax money for that, you're pulling in your business owner, you're pulling a distribution out of your company, you're paying tax on that, 
then you go pay for your for your oh, trip. Oh, I mean, if you do it personal, I just I could just write it off. Is that what if, you're saying? For business, it's a it's it's already a write off. Okay. For personal, if you use points, there's no tax implications. Okay. So you don't have to pull the cash out of your company and pay tax on what you're taking as a distribution to go pay for the trip. You just use the points for the trip, even if they were generated from business expenses. Walk me through this. There's no tax implication. So this is not received as income or property. It's technically as like a uh, count as like a rebate. Okay. And so if, whether it's cash back or points, there's no tax implications. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah, it's that's a huge. A... It's a huge perk. That's why business owners who have small business credit cards, like once you get to high multiple eight figures or nine figures and you're using corporate credit and you're not really earning points as much, you're almost like kind of outgrowing that as an, as an owner. Mm -hmm. But for anyone that's in like the multiple six to seven to eight to multiple eight figure business uh, range in terms of top line revenue, they're typically going to have one or many cards underneath that business that are gonna be underneath their name. They're personally guaranteeing it, even though it's applied for underneath the business's LLC. So you're saying that if you got, you guys, obviously you have your own business, you're gonna use your personal card for travel because it doesn't, and there's no tax implications, even though you're doing it for your business. Well, if I was using points, if I was yeah. redeeming the points, got right? It. Yeah, okay. I, would use it, I would use that. So if I'm gonna book travel and pay for it, there's like two ways to book travel. Yeah. You pay for it or you use points. If yeah. I'm gonna pay for it, most of my travel is business too, because I'm, I run a travel company. Yeah. So I'm just gonna, if I'm paying for it, I put it on a business card because it's a write-off. Yeah. If it's a personal trip, I'm gonna use points. In some cases, I'll use points for a business trip if it's like a really high-end one. Yeah. Like last year, this was a, a fun example. We had, I, I run a ski trip every year for entrepreneurs. We had 42 people go to Chamonix, France. 25 of us flew Emirates business class together and there's an in-flight bar. So mm. there's like, you know, double decker where there's 25 of us hanging out at this like cocktail bar. 35,000 feet, the flight attendants come back and like, what the fuck are you guys doing? We're like, <laughs> we're like, we're, we Who's made in charge it. Here? So like, that was one where it was like a $5,000 ticket. I could have written that off in the business, but I was like, I, I don't want to do that to our company right now. So yeah. I use points, even though it was a business expense. Got it. So it just depends on where you're at. But if you had to prioritize it, use points for personal travel first, then you want to use points for really expensive business travel. Like you'd work backwards like that. Do you guys specialize at all with tax implications? Like, have you ever had clients that are like, they think they can write something off and like, no, 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 you can't get write this off. I'm going to get you, you're going to get yourself in trouble. You ever have anything? No, like whenever that? someone comes to us with those kinds of questions, it's like, I can tell you about points and credit. Yeah. I am not. So you guys stay my, out of that. Yeah. Arena. I don't want to touch anything. That's all good. Dude, I, my, my account, she's a wizard. I was like, I didn't know you could write this. She's like, I, I, these are things I thought I could write off that I couldn't. And then things that I uh, didn't know I could write off that I could. And then the percent, like for instance, my rent, like I work from home, right? I have a, a my studio is built in the house. So it's like one of these things where it's like, what percentage of my home can I write off as far as rent? I didn't understand any of that. So that's mm -hmm. a whole, whole nother specialty uh, when it comes to that. But the fact, the idea, I think uh, when you take out a loan, I think it's something similar like with the tax implications. Right. right. Uh, so points don't count as income or they right. don't count as property. So when right. you, when you sell, buy and sell crypto, that counts as regular property. Right. They don't it's, even asset, yeah. it's not even like equities. It's just mm -hmm. regular property. So this, in this case, it's not even, a, it's a rebate. Correct. That's, that's amazing. Okay. That's a huge, that's a huge, um, a piece of information right there, man. Um, so in order, if somebody well, like when your situation, you, you save $20 million, can you break down like, where is 1 million coming from and another million? Like where, where's all this, yeah. this, this rebate or this discount coming from? For sure. So I'll scale it back. I wouldn't yeah. definitely wouldn't say it was 20 million, but I would just say if, just in terms of what I did last yeah. year. So I, I quite, I, I've got a spreadsheet. I track all this stuff because yeah. I'm, I'm like a nerd, but last year I redeemed, I think it was 4.7 million points and miles. I'm sorry, I meant to say oh. 20 million miles. I, I think that's what you said. What, what, what did, you said oh, it somewhere gosh. on a different podcast. Maybe I said it wrong. Well, let's just say this. Just last year alone, I've redeemed 4.7 million yes. points. So over the last decade, definitely 20 million. And our team, okay. I mean, he, it could be, you could have heard something about our clients too, because yeah. la last year alone, we did probably close to 100 million in points redemption for our clients that saved multiple millions of dollars. Yeah, that's probably what it was. Yeah, yeah. Probably, yeah. okay, yeah. Cool. yeah. So, you know, I do it obviously for us and many of our clients, but yeah, just last year it was about, I think it was about 4.7 million points. So that might've been Amex Chase, Marriott points. How, how are you generating these points? That's what I think yeah. a lot of people want to know. How does it, you, if you're not, if we're not spending $200,000 a year on travel, mm -hmm. how am I getting mm -hmm. that million, that many million points? Yeah. And like I said, this is where it started for me because yeah. like I said, I was making, you know, exec chef, it was like, you know, 75, 80, 90,000 in yeah. that range. So it was like, how can I, how can I maximize this? I don't have hundreds of thousands or millions in spends. So the less we're spending, the more important the card strategy is. It's using the right cards where, you know, I've got a card that I use just for flights for 5X points. I've got a card just for food. That's 4X. So I kind of call it like optimizing your return on spend. So essentially that, that points earning piece is one, the biggest one is using the right cards for the right things 
to maximize your points earnings. So if I, if I take your course at the end, how many cards am I going to have? What do you, what would you say on average? I mean, honestly, the best, a, you got to be able to execute on it and yeah. keep it clean and efficient. So yeah. I basically say it's, it's three cards, three cards for your spend. Everyone has to ask themselves, what are the two big, you know, what are my two biggest expenses? You know, a lot of people will say travel and food. So yeah. the kind of the exercise is, okay, you know, what's the best card for points earning on travel expenses? So the Chase Sapphire Reserve, probably my favorite card for all things travel. Mm. So now in your head, okay, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm buying a flight. Okay, I got to use my Chase Sapphire Reserve card. It's travel. An Amex Gold card is 4X on food, including grocery. So same thing. If I'm thinking about food. If I do Uber Eats, would that also count? Sure does. Bro, that's incredible. Okay. I, dude, I'm home. I don't have a kitchen, man. I'm Uber Eats and, you know, how, whatever how much, I how much, how much? So uh, I think my uh, Chase Sapphire Reserve was 550 a year. How much is the Amex one? Uh, the Amex Gold, I think they just raised it to 250 And I can touch on the annual. $250? Yeah. Oh, and, and damn. Okay. Yeah. So for some reason in my mind, I'm thinking the Amex card is going to be way more expensive the, the than platinum, the Chase card. The platinum is expensive. Which one? How much is that? Like 800 bucks? 695. Six, 695. Okay. I, I spend 5,000 a year on annual fees across all my cards and I don't even sweat it. Yeah. I wouldn't either. Like for as much as we travel, I think it would be yeah. worth it. Like and, if, if, when, when I put, when I put down the 550s, my first ever credit card, I'm thinking to myself, um, Oh man, I, I, $550. I mean, it paid for itself in the first month. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, there's the, you know, the cards are loaded with perks and benefits and, and free nights and all this and that. So, at the end of the day, if you're just looking at annual fees, aside from the points, at the very least, you should, you're going to break even on the extra value and things on those cards. So, I don't sweat those. But I guess kind of going back to that, you know, how do we earn those points? Take those two biggest items that you're spending and think on an annual basis. You know, each transaction, you might be like, oh, you know, what does it matter? But look at an annual number. So, you know, we got our travel card, Chase Reserve, Amex Gold is food. And now for simplicity, it's like, okay, well, I don't need to add too many layers here. What's a card that's going to earn me, you know, just a flat 2X on all my purchases? Mm. So, like, I use a Capital One Venture X for that. So, essentially, I've got 5X, you know, 3 to 10X on my travel spend. Mm. I've got 4X on my food spend. And now I've got 2X on all my other purchases. So... You know, you can slap some numbers behind that on an annual basis, and it it turns into a lot. Okay. Um, so that only not only are you earning the right types of points to use later on, but we're maximized. So you know, that's a key piece. So one is optimizing your return on spend. Lots of people talk about sign up bonuses and stuff like that. They're cool, but it's a one time hit, and a lot of people screw up and just kind of aimlessly go grab a card that they don't even know you know what it is. So it's like. Yeah, you can go get sign-up bonuses as long as your spend is dialed in. So that's the second one. We're in the credit card space, which is great. So I get a ton of points from referring out my credit cards. Yeah, I probably did almost a million points just from referring the cards. So that the I referral have. code that you give to your friends. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. And it seems small, but once you understand what you can do with these points, these small little things turn into a lot. Um, so, so if you, I, I don't know if you heard Alex Ramosi, he talks about he and his wife go out to eat at a restaurant every night, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and my girlfriend and I, we either go out to eat somewhere or I order in, so I should probably get an MX gold for that. I mean, I spent like, I was looking at how much I spent on food and it's outrageous. So yeah. yeah. So that would be your dedicated card for all things food. Okay. And you know, essentially just think of it like this, you using that card for your food can ultimately turn into like a round trip business class to Europe. And, and I can, I mean, the thing you were saying before, I can now funnel all three of these cards into all into American or British Airways, like you said before, right. I can funnel them. I can st set up a loyalty program for all three of them and then go, instead of Ex using their portal, go into whatever that airline is. Exactly. Yeah. So the key is we want to earn those transferable points and we mm. want to keep stacking them up. But remember that they've got a fixed value mm. when they're assigned within the banks. But when we go to redeem those points, we get to break away from that fixed value when we transfer them out. Mm. And now we're booking off those award charts. So like that strategy I just laid out, now we have Chase Points, we have Amex and Capital One. We have all three of the big currencies and there's things with Chase that you can't do with Capital One and there's things with Amex you can't do with Chase. So having a diversified points lineup even further opens the door for literally limitless potential with um, what you can do with them and also the value uh, you can get out of them. Um, so how, how does this affect credit? So you paying off a card every month, uh, that kind of, let's just say somebody has a business and they're running up like 10 grand a month, uh, and they pay it off every month. How does this affect their credit? Like to, to go from one score to another, I wouldn't even know where to start. Like how, 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 yeah. how would that work? Yeah. So, I mean, if you do this smart, your credit's going to build okay. over time. 
So there's a couple factors to credit. There's five main factors. Your main one being payment history, and then your second main one being utilization, which mm -hmm. is how much you use versus how much your uh, is being lent to you. So as you do this, you're going to get higher limits, which means your utilization is going to go down, which means your score is going to go up. Banks are like, you know, the the terminology that I heard that one time or one time was basically like they want to give you an umbrella when it's sunny and take it away when it's rainy. Yeah. Right. So when you need the money, you're not going to get it. So you want to make sure that you get that utilization down because when you do that, that's when you can get higher limits. That's when you get increased credit lines and that's when your score continues. So with that, would you be able to get the utilization down by having multiple cards? By having multiple cards, yeah. by paying it down or the fastest hack. This is a great hack for someone who's just like, shit, my credit's kind of fucked. Like, how do I fix it? It's called the authorized user strategy. So let's say you were like, I'm new to credit. I have a $20,000 limit. I'm using $10,000. That's 50% utilization. If your utilization's at 50%, your score is going to be probably in like the high 600s because it's really high, right? To a bank that looks risky. Well, let's say you have a friend who has a, has a card with a $30,000 limit. They can add you as an authorized user. The history from just that card will show up on your credit report. Mm. You don't actually get the card, so you can't spend on it, so there's no risk to them. Now, you're using 10,000 out of 50,000, so your utilization went down to 20%. Instead of 50%, your score is going to pop like 50 points. Uh, when utilization, if I if I put on, let's say, say I have a $10,000 limit and I spend $10,000, and then but I pay it off before I even get to the end of yeah, the yeah. month, is that going to hurt my utilization score? No, no, score? You're, you're, you're good. It's basically, so the way that utilization reports is there's a, re, there's a statement closing date and a statement due date, mm. right? So there's a payment, or excuse me, a statement, statement closing date and a payment due date. You have to make sure that that utilization is low during your statement closing date. Okay. That's when the bank reports it to the credit bureau and says, hey, here's how much he's using. Um, am I crazy in thinking, like there was a point where I was like, I knew I had a trip coming up, so I tried to pay off everything earlier so that I could get the points earlier so that I could use those points. Is that is that value, is that it's, accurate? It depends or, on the- Or are they gonna wait to, to the end of the pay period to, to give you my points? Yeah, it'll depend. Um, you know, Chase generally, they'll do theirs like at the end of the statement. So okay. it's like, you know what, yeah, you could pay it early, but usually once that statement closed, then they'll post. Um, like, I think Amex generally, like if you pay early, they're going to give you the points. But I think the biggest piece, kind of like what Eli was saying, was those two dates. You know, their due date, hey, I don't owe anybody anything. And then that close date, if our utilization is high, like I said, you have a $10,000 line. Let's say you met, you know, you've got you know, 10000 of 10000 being spent and your statement closes. Yeah. You don't owe anybody anything yet. But to the banks, your utilization you are using is hundred percent. So now your risk, your so high risk. So what I do, and we recommend people do, is I have all my closing dates across all my cards for the end of the month on the thirtieth. I like to keep my credit score above eight hundred. Yeah. So I like to keep my utilization low. So instead of waiting for the due date, I kind of keep up in real time. I'm I'm, I'm spending and paying currently. So on the twenty eighth of the month, I go in and I'm I'm paying my cards down so that when that statement closes. Not only is my balance is paid down, now my utilization is you know con consistently under ten percent, where I'm able to maintain that eight hundred plus credit score. Um, like I said, you know, if you need to wait for the, you can wait for the due date, no problem. But if you can keep up with it, because the idea is if we're paying interest on cards and we're earning points, we're just negating value. So if you can kind of get in that um, kind of habit of staying current with everything. Your yeah. credit's in great was, shape. That's why yeah. I never had a credit card uh, because yeah. I, I just heard nightmare stories of people, you know, r massive amounts of consumer debt that we have in this mm -hmm. country. And I was like, I don't need any of that. I'm just if, if I can't buy it in cash, mm -hmm. why the hell am I buying it? But then somebody starts explaining to me the idea of points and miles and a credit score mm -hmm. in, in case I want to put a down payment on a house or go buy a Tesla or some shit. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I need to do this, right? This is yeah. something I would. Being in the military, there's a lot of things you learn. Like, I know how to navigate through the Middle East very well, but there's a mm -hmm. lot of things you don't learn because they handle it for you. Like, I didn't buy health insurance. I'm a disabled vet. I don't have to buy health. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. Some of the lessons sure. I never get have to learn. If I wanted to travel somewhere, I just jump on a C-17 and they'd strap me in the back and I would go. I had the idea of like, and it was free. So I, I just didn't yeah. understand a lot of these, uh, these concepts. So well, it's, it's really interesting. One other thing to touch on with that, Michael, is, uh, is really that difference between personal credit and business credit. And this yeah. is, this is huge because specifically we're first off our credit system in the U S like it, for a lot of reasons, you would know this being born in the U S you're fucking lucky sperm gang off the bat. Right. Yeah. The U.S. credit system is far superior to anywhere else in the world, specifically business credit, because business credit cards don't show up in your personal credit report, the vast majority. Oh, wow. So what yeah. that means the is corporate, the, whole, the corporate veil. It, totally. Yeah. I mean, but you might have six companies, you're taking on debt. That it, it makes sense. Like you shouldn't personally be impacted by that if your company's in a weird spot, but you're still responsible, right? So if, it defa if you default, like that's going to come back to bite you in the ass. Yeah. But when it comes to that utilization piece, this is a huge unlock. 
So let's say you have that 50% utilization on your personal credit. I already know where you're going with this. I get it. Yeah. You balance transfer it or you move it or you carry that balance on your business card. You keep your personal credit clean. And your, but your utilization in your business is high, but it doesn't affect your personal they credit. They won't exactly. see it. So okay. like, let's say the only bank that would see is the bank you have with. So if you're going to apply for a card at Amex and you have, you could have $100,000 of, of debt at Chase. Ideally, it's at 0%, so it's not compounding. That's like the, the best way to do it is get 0% interest business cards. But if you have that at Chase, Amex can only see what's on your personal credit report and what other credit you have with Amex. So they won't know that your your business is carrying 100K with Chase. So they'd be like, okay, here's 50K more. So when you say transfer, what do you mean? I'm transferring to, to my other card. How do I do that? Balance transfer? Yeah. So depending on the, I mean, you want to make sure you have a card that has a 0% uh, balance transfer promotion because okay. not all cards do that. And then you would go in and you'd basically, yeah, you'd set you, there's a way to just click like send the payment. I would go from my Chase Sapphire to my Chase Inc. And I would balance transfer whatever stuff I had left on there. That's the idea. You just can't balance transfer between two cards at the same bank because they don't want to like take the debt. Oh, so got you, it. you would have to move it from one bank to another. But yeah, basically. Which, but, but one personal card to a business card. That would be the, yeah, that's okay. the goal. But you need to be able to get approved for that business card first. So business cards have a little bit more of a, there's a little more strict um, requirements around the applications. Yeah. So, but they're going off of your personal credit. So that's why it's important to keep your personal credit clean. This is a, it's going to sound like a really basic question to you guys, but I don't know. So we have a business card for my company, but like it's just one physical card. And if I need something, I'll just, I'll ask them for the number. Can you issue actual multiple physical cards for one account for, is that how this works? Mm -hmm. You can do yeah. that? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I just, I know it's probably a really basic question, yeah, but I just never thought about cool. it. Yeah. Employee cards. I mean, you were yeah. asking the example before, like a company that's spending this and they have sales reps. If your sales reps are out eating, they're out staying in hotels, they're out on flights, ideally they should have an employee card. And if they're spending money, you should be getting those points oh, as the business owner. Wow. So, I mean, that's a huge opportunity. It kind of sucks for the sales rep, right? If you set it up that way, but they get the, they wow. get the points for the flight and for staying like, you know, in that bed. They'll yeah, get but the, we're paying for their food, right? You're yeah, paying for everything else. So you should get the, you. Yeah. 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 And then you don't have to deal with reimbursements, less friction in the business too. That's incredible. Okay. Um, can you guys tell me, so the, the ones you were saying before, uh, Amex Gold, uh, which was the name of the Citibank one? I was the capital, uh, so my, that, oh, capital that one. third card, so we had Chase Sapphire Reserve. Chase Sapphire These are all Reserve. personal cards, yeah. by the way. Uh -huh. the Amex Gold, and then the other one that I like to use is like that catch-all card. It's going to be the Capital One Venture X card. Got it. Um, you know, it's a premium card, just like those other ones, but the idea there is it's that minimum of 2X on all of your spend. So that's the big takeaway there is... We want to. We don't want to earn just one X on anything we do. Yeah. If two X should be the floor, and then those opportunities with food, travel to increase it, that's kind of the game. I, I didn't really have a lot of credit. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to get approved, and I did. What are some reasons why I wouldn't get approved for those three cards? So when you're going, when you basically do any application, right? Yeah. They're checking your your personal credit profile with those five factors. Yeah. Payment history is a big one. So late payments or collections. Yeah. Big no no. Specifically, the more recent they are, the more they're going to impact you. As they age, they become less impactful, and then after seven years, they fall off. So that's the biggest issue, right? So that's going to be number one. The utilization piece is also really important. So there's kind of two things to think about when you're looking at, like, how's my credit doing? There's what's on your credit report. So what is your utilization? What's your payment history? How many inquiries? And there's your actual score. So typically, having a good score will get you in the door, right? But then your report will dictate how much you get approved for as well. So some people will also apply for cards and they get approved, but they're getting a $2,000 limit. And they run a million dollar business. They're like, "This I can't do shit with this." Mm. And that is typically because their score is decent, but the their credit history isn't that strong, or they have a little bit too high of utilization. Mm. So there's a couple things to clean up there. So the, the payment history, the utilization are usually the main ones. The other one would be if you have too many recent inquiries. That's typically the third one that people run into. People they, running your credit check. Yes. Too many of okay. Four, four credit cards. Four credit. Four cards. credit cards. Okay. If you have, you know, if you've got a mortgage or you've, you know, applied for a car loan, that's different. The banks are going to be looking at how many credit card inquiries have you, do you have. And there's, you know, there, you may know this, but there's like tons of different actual credit scores. So there's your Vantage versus your FICO. Then yeah. there's like FICO 8 versus FICO 5, 4. There's like a whole bunch of them. The FICO 8 is the main one you, you want to be looking at, not any of the other things. Like that's the main score. If I do pay off things early every month, is my utilization at zero? Essentially, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like I said, you might have some transactions in between, you know, that last couple of days of the statement. And you don't need to have it at zero. Okay. The key is we want to keep that at 10% or less. Okay. So, That's if I, the key. so a thousand dollars on a card for the $10,000 limit. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And as your utilization goes higher, your score is exponentially impacted. And this is not just on an individual card, but this, they look at it on two pieces. It's your overall utilization. Like I've got 30 cards. 
Well, they're going to look at overall, you've got, okay, $300,000 credit line. How much of it are you using overall? Do you guys have 30 cards? Do people have, like, regular people have 30 cards? Not recommended not, no, for no, other not, not regular have. people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I, that seems like a lot you'd be spending. So, by the way, those three cards that you recommended mm -hmm. before, how much am I spending total uh, a year in, in fees? In annual fees? Yeah. Let's see. So Like 1200 bucks. Be right around a thousand. A thousand bucks, okay. But what's going to happen is, I mean, just with even the Chase card or the Capital One card, you're pulling six hundred dollars right off of it because they have a travel, you know, an annual travel credit. So it's like you can go on, book any kind of travel, and you'll get an automatic statement credit. So you know, essentially, the cards are damn near close to just really kind of breaking even on a pure cash, you know, credit towards your towards your annual fees. Before so, before you even get points, they're breaking even. Yeah. The points aside, so the way I look at the annual fees is is basically like, hey, everything else associated with this card beyond the points, I should at the very least break even. And uh, honestly, in most cases, I still am able to extract additional values you know, from those uh, without even talking points. Uh, Tommy, you, you mentioned, I think before you wait till the last minute. Um, I've, I had a, a business partner of mine and it was so annoying because we'd be like, we wouldn't have the flights booked or whatever. And he'd wait till the last minute. I'm like, dude, are you not getting screwed over? Because I, I would always buy, maybe again, when I would, uh, I was a mission planner in the mm. Air Force. The, the, we'd get the, the orders from uh, headquarters three weeks before we flew the mission. So in my mind, like it's still, I'm still like this. I show up to like, I wake up to go to the airport four hours and 15 minutes before my flight. And I still book my flights 21 days before I go out. This is just, this is my air force mentality, yep. but you're saying last minute flights are, are, are something better to do. Yeah. So especially, you know, if we look at it and there's two ways to book this flight, you know, yeah. there's going to be cash. And then we now we've got these points we're talking about. Yeah. So generally, talking cash as we get closer to departure a lot of time you know majority of times your cash flights are going to go up, go up. And, and the panic is like oh I, you know i gotta book this they're gonna they're gonna go up with points though it's almost the opposite where it's actually going to be in your benefit to book last minute you know most of my flights every now and then i've got one that's way 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 out in advance but essentially if you think about it like this is the airlines want somebody's butt in the seat no matter what yes they'd rather be bringing in revenue but at the end of the day if you know the business class cabin is 40 percent unoccupied they're going to release more and more of these seats to you know the points in the miles piece where all of a sudden a, you know an airline mile that's a debt or a liability to the airline yeah so if we can't bring in the revenue let's open these seats up so that we can decrease the debt or liability and obviously they said they want people to sweat get a little nervous and, and pay cash but as we get closer six weeks four weeks two weeks and even days up that's when they start really releasing all these seats. So really that last minute is kind of the prime time. So when you say last minute, you mean like in, within four days, not like actually walking up to the airport? Um, I mean, hey, at the end of the day, I've, I've absolutely booked flights for that same day, or I've had flights booked that maybe a day or two before. Well, maybe I was in business class and guess what? Well, first class just opened up. <coughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly first class instead. So they really make you squeeze, but essentially that sweet spot starts to open up starting at around six weeks and then you know four weeks, two weeks, and then literally leading into day of departure. So huge opportunity, you know, to kind of do it on the last minute. And then the other side of that is you want to be way in advanced. So let's say you're trying to plan a bucket list trip for, you know, a year from now, the more planning you can do ahead of time and get that booked as soon as those seats get released with like the, you know, the dates and everything. That's great too. To be way in advance. So you're saying in these in these uh, loyalty programs, a specific flight might not have any ability to use points on, but you could be waiting until the end, and then all of a sudden it pops up. Yeah, correct. So there's okay. kind of like two ways. So basically, when we're talking about these transferring of the points, yeah. Um, let's just say this: the the, the seat's either going to be available for points or it's not. Okay. So you know, ideally, we want to find a seat that's available. We can then, and only then, transfer our points and book it. Well, let's just say this is a need flight. Like, I can't screw around and, and wait. Maybe it'll pop. Well, we can still use points. You can go right through Chase Travel and redeem your points for 1.5 cents each. Yeah. You needed a flight. You had points. You got it covered. But that goes back to that fixed value thing where it's 1.5 cents per point. If we do find those seats available through the partners off the award charts we might be able to book that same flight for, you know, a quarter of the amount of points. Mm. You get what I'm saying? So, you know, breaking away from that fixed value. So it's kind of like a little game of cat and mouse. Um, but essentially said when you can find those flights that are available, 
that's where the sweet spot is for the points. But if you're strategic with your points and your cards, at the end of the day, if you have to go through the travel portals to redeem your points, it's still a win. Yeah. But there's ways to hit the home runs. And if you can hit a couple home runs and have some singles in the mix, I mean, that's at the end of the day, that's all you could hope for. I know some people that are just like loyal to one airline and try to get as much as they can out of it. So a buddy of mine, he's a Marine Corps pilot and he he flies Southwest anytime he can. Mm -hmm. He's going to fly Southwest because of all the, the perks that he gets on there. Um, is there for you guys, have you found one airline to be better than the other when it comes to stuff like this? One airline is going to give you four X points and one airline isn't. So when it comes to the experience of, well, first off, we got to break out two different segments here because yeah. international flying, <laughs> not even close to domestic, you know, these yes. Middle Eastern airline carriers, the Asian ones, like the experience is through the roof comparatively. For me, domestic, my favorite domestic seat is going to be JetBlue Mint. So if I have the opportunity to fly that, it's their first class program. I'm not a big fan of like loyalty in general because I want to book. A lot of people don't know JetBlue owns JSX. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and yeah. JSX is now flying. You know, they they're were just flying expanded. up and down the West yeah. Coast. Now they're flying they're yeah. to De Dallas and places mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you, there's still not a lot of good points options for that yet. I not think for that not for JSX. No. Because no. everyone here, we love JSX. Yeah. Because sorry, fuck that airport in Los Angeles. That thing is horrible. <laughs> you land in El Segundo. I'm not kidding. When you get off the plane at LAX, it will be one hour and fifteen minutes before you check into. From when you leave, forget your baggage. From the moment you leave to the moment you check into your hotel is an hour and fifteen minutes. It's outrageous, bro. Yeah, that's why we decided road trip on this. We were like, fuck it. Of course, yeah. of course. I don't. I don't blame you yeah. at all, man. Yeah. Like, dude, dude, Sky Harbor to to Vegas is fine, but but Sky Harbor exactly. to Vegas. On JSX, it's like you're there in 10 minutes and yeah. then you're off in 10. So, yeah, yeah a yeah. points program for JSX would be awesome. Yeah. That is. So, so domestically, for me personally, I live in Austin, right? So, there's not a major hub. So, that's a big factor. Yeah. If you live in Atlanta, everything's Delta. If you yes. live, you know, if you live in LA or Chicago, you have more options. If you're in Dallas, everything's uh, American. American. American and Southwest at uh, Love Field. Yeah. Exactly. So, so that's a big factor too because there's just a convenience player depending on where you live. Mm -hmm. So, for me, JetBlue Mint is my favorite domestic first class. If I have a choice on like a major carrier, I'm probably flying Delta the most for experience but then there's like nuances to okay you know if i want better points and stuff like that you might make some different choices but best overall experience for me is delta i don't know if you have a different opinion on that yeah i mean i, I was a united guy for years but i think there's a couple of pieces like because you know status isn't necessarily for everybody i mean if you're someone that's spending you know at least five or six thousand dollars a year on flights i'm going to tell you that you know, it's going to be in your benefit to try to be loyal to an airline now don't be loyal to an airline if it means you have to make two connections and you can fly nonstop with southwest but to have kind of a primary um airline because you know points are great you know status is great but when we have the two together oh incredible that's yeah. really yeah. where it, you know it kind of doubles down am i crazy or does it feel like um spirit and frontier have the best routes and i try so hard to not fly them and I, it just, I going to Miami, man, that red eye is just, it's the most perfect time to go, but I'm stuck with my knees up to my mm -hmm. chest. Mm -hmm. am, am I crazy? Is it, is this your experience I don't, as honestly, well? Honestly, and I don't, yeah. I don't even look at them. Okay. Yeah. I, so I'm not sure. Of but course. Yeah. You know, I, I their I routes are either. so good. There's so, like, whenever I want a route, they always have one way to Miami. And it's in, when I look at American or Southwest, there's always multiple. I just don't understand how they keep getting better routes than everyone else. Well, they're, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, they're targeting those like, Hey, what is everybody yeah. else doing? How can we slide in here and, mm -hmm. and, crazy. and put something and that's the tickets, $25 and yeah, it's $174 right. for luggage. Like, Oh, you wanted oxygen. Yeah. Today. You didn't you want to ox you, yeah. 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 you yeah. bring your own yeah. oxygen. Well, what's, sure. what's funny about that too is like, so Tommy and I both have, you know, we've grown our Instagram and I know that's a big yeah. thing that you, that you talk a lot about. Um, with all the travel stuff, and it's hilarious. So we post all this like sexy shit, epic first yeah. class, crazy redemption. The get the most engaged stories. If I have to fly like economy, I end up in a middle seat yeah. by the toilet. Fucking story views through the roof. Oh, yeah. and people so just great. love because yeah. they remember it. So <laughs> one time, oh, I don't know if you guys remember, there was um, Dan Fleischman uh, through this event in uh, Salt Lake a couple of months ago, and so it's crazy because I'm coming from back from Cancun and we land in Salt Lake. So what we just happened to be on this flight with all these guys from Salt Lake going back to Vegas and they were all going to charter a plane, but they like couldn't do it last second or whatever. So I'm on a flight with Brad Lee, Ryan Pineda, like a bunch of these like huge these guys. Some of these guys were worth $100 million and we're all flying on a Southwest flight together, sitting middle seat. I'm like right, waving over at Ryan. It was like it was like it was like a self-help coaching uh, a flight back home, but, but we didn't care. It was it was Salt Lake That's to awesome. Vegas. Nobody, nobody really cared. So that was just, that was a really interesting situation. Um, in this situation, I've never bought a first class flight. 
Um, and so because I've never bought one, I'm curious, what is the multiple? So for me to go from uh, economy to first class, is that a 4X multiple, a 2X multiple? What is it usually? Well, so think about it like this, and this is, you know, this is my favorite way to use points. Yeah. I don't like to use points to fly economy or, you know, stay at the Holiday Inn. I mean, yeah. I like to do points, use points in scenarios where it's like, hey, you know, how do I justify this extra cost? Like, you know, I can fly an economy for 300, but first is 750. So, you know, that points kind of pulls that price piece out of it. But I would say with first class, well, there's ways to get up there without necessarily paying cash. And that's where that elite status piece comes into play. Mm. So, you know, if you are someone that's spending it on that five to $6,000 minimum, and you're loyal to an airline. Well, and I did this for years, all in my 20s. There's no way I was able to afford business class or first class. So, so I can get elite status just using points. So I use my credit card points. Well, I go just to Delta and I use those and I can get elite status or do I have to spend cash with there's, Delta? There's some ways, but the, you know, the primary way with earning elite status is you, know, you flying with that airline. Mm. There's other little intricacies, like there's some ways where you know, spending on your credit card does count towards status. So there's ways to supplement it, but you know, I, the main function is, hey, if you're flying, choose your airline and be loyal. So all in my 20s, I was flying United. You know, I had some work trips here in the mix, but every year I was hitting that, you know, I was hitting like platinum levels. So not the top, top, but still kind of on that upper tier where- How much are we spending for platinum? Um, you know, it's obviously, they increase the spend sure. every single year. Um, but you know, back in that time, I was probably around 7,500, 8,000 okay. a year, something uh, like that. Doable, had some yeah. work, had some corporate work uh, travel that kind of helped uh, bridge that gap. but. I would pick my flights strategically where I'd be able to look at the seat maps and be like, well, shit, you know, there's, there's nine unoccupied seats in, in first class. Well, I'm going to be on the upgrade list. So for literally for seven or eight years, I was leveraging my status and booking flights that were giving me the best chance at an upgrade where I'd probably say 70, 75%, 80% of the time I'd be flying on an economy fare, mm. earning my credit card points. I'm earning my airline miles three days before departure. Wake up to that. It's my favorite text to wake up to is, congrats, you've been upgraded oh, to. So it's not something you ask for. They just give it to you. It's, it's, it's literally, an, you know, they look Amazing. at the status, you know, what fair class. So there's all these factors that go into it. But essentially, you, know, you look at that list three days before, you see the upgrade list. And sometimes that upgrade list is 40 or 50 people deep, especially like now. It's kind of gotten harder with the complimentary ones. But having status helps you get up front at the economy price. And then, I, you know, Eli and I kind of have the same thing where it's like, if it's more than a two and a half, my, mine's kind of like three hours. If it's more than a three hour flight, like I'm, I'm going to figure out a way to get up front in the most cost effective way possible. If it's, you know, under three hours and you know, I'm not going to pay triple the price to sit up front for, you know, a two hour yeah. flight or yeah. if the scheduling. So there's different factors in it, but the easiest way to get up to first class is to a, be able to maximize your credit card points to use that for that first class seat. Or if you are into that upper tier elite status, you know that gets you up front without the extra costs as well. Um, the best hotels. Do you guys have a? Is it a loyalty thing with the hotels as well? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Hyatt. Okay, their program is amazing. Now, the thing that a lot of people don't fully recognize until they look into this is what brands are actually a part of the larger hotel portfolio. Mm. So, like Marriott um, and Starward had that like merger. Really, Marriott acquired them. Uh, a few years back, right? So they, SPG had all of these amazing hotels like W, St. Regis. Those are now Marriott properties. Mm. And so just like a, a cool example to kind of tie the two together. Um, when I first met my girlfriend two summers ago, I was in Europe for a month. I brought her out on a trip, right? I redeemed into a hotel with points, but because I have top status with Hyatt, which is called their globalist status, which you can get without staying a single night in a Hyatt hotel. You can get it just from credit card spend. So I could be spending money on my business to pay my employees or to you know, and there's ways to put payroll on cards and stuff like that. And I can get top status just from spending on the Hyatt credit card. Who's giving you top status? Is it your credit card? It's not a Hyatt credit card. It is a Hyatt credit card. Oh, you you have a separate card that's a Hyatt credit yes. card. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's after I kind of covered, okay, I have enough Chase and Amex points. Now I want to get into like specific, what we call co-branded cards. So this is a Hyatt card. Yeah. Okay. So I have top status with them. So brought her out. I ended up using 130,000 Chase points, which normally if you go through Chase Travel is worth $1,300. Mm because I also have status, we got upgraded into this two bedroom villa in Sardinia in Italy it was fucking awesome for four nights. It was a $13,000 hotel stay. Mm. And so instead of getting $1,300 out of those points, I got 13,000. Yeah. That's the power of status. It was an amazing room. You walk in, you got free breakfast, you get free upgrades. Sometimes you get on-site credits and all stuff, all that sort of stuff. Um, early check-in and late check-out. So to me, Hyatt is the best points program. They have out of the major three hotel portfolios between Hyatt, Hilton and Marriott, 
they have the least number of properties. So that's a factor too. Like Marriott has the biggest footprint. Mm. So that's a, a big factor. But he has, uh, we call him, we don't call him Tommy, Tommy Lonergan. We call him Ambassador Elite Tommy Lonergan. Whenever he walks in, I'm like, oh, the ambassador's here. It's the highest level with Marriott. And he's, he's got that. So uh, that's, that's his brand. Yeah. They haven't put your name on the side of an, uh, a hotel or a side of a yeah, airplane you, yet. Yeah. You know, I'm sure they've got me on the wall somewhere. Yeah. Um, that's for sure. But, you know, kind of with that, that elite status, we were talking about the airlines. You yeah. know, there is there value with the airline status? Yes. But with these hotel things, now the Hyatt is the best value play in terms of getting a ton of value for your points for accommodations. But, you know, I'm Marriott, but essentially when it comes to, you know, kind of that same idea concept of booking a standard room or booking an economy seat, it's like having that hotel status you know, I'm, I'm always booking a standard room, you know, probably in between 200, 250 a night, whatever it is. But now showing up with my elite status, I'm in a suite every night and I'm doing 300 nights a year in a hotel. Yeah. So if every single night that I step foot into a Marriott, I'm getting a room that's $500 more expensive than what it was over the course of 300 nights. I mean, we're looking at a, a huge amount of money here with the hotel cards or with the hotel status, we kind of call these supplemental cards. You know, our core cards are the ones we're spending on. This next tier is kind of like supplemental where you could have a Hilton card or a Marriott card that just by holding the card, you now have top tier elite status with mm. the hotel. And even if you don't stay in a hotel, you know, maybe you only do a couple weekends a year or 10 nights, just by having that card, all of a sudden you've got your status. Now we're talking upgrades, we're talking savings, you know, there's breakfast, the early, I've checked into hotels at five in the morning and they welcome me with open arms. Mm. Um, so that piece there is, you know, you're not worried about spending on that card per se, but having a card like that, A, it's gonna heighten the travel experience, you're gonna earn more points, you're gonna save more money. Um, so in terms of the status play, there's way more value to be had on the hotel side and it is very easy to um, obtain compared to doing the airline stuff. Um, where do you, so at this point now we've got maybe six cards. We've got a Marriott, a Hyatt, uh, card, and we got a, um, a Hilton card. And then we, oh, then we're going to have a, uh, like you said, a chase, uh, a city bank and, a um, an Amex. So at this point, where do you get, do you guys just put them all in your Apple wallet? Like, where do you put all these cards? Is that what you usually do? Mostly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we both have uh, we call it the credit man purse. Yeah. yeah. We have like, this big stack of just like 40 credit cards. But again, that's, that's just because we've been in this for a long time and we're both nerds and love it. Yeah. That's not what everyone should be doing. But yeah, Apple Wallet is the go-to. I mean, most of the cards, I don't even know where the physical card is anymore. It's just oh, so wow. rare. Okay, so that's what that's what I was yeah, asking. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. have like... I'm like, just thinking of my dad with the... You remember people in the 1980s with a big old wallet? Yeah. And it had like $300 yeah, worth of cash and it, it was just fat. And the thing was just like about to break. <laughs> just sitting like this. Big old... Just, yeah, yeah, big yeah. old just... like You could see it in their pocket. People getting yeah. pickpocketed and it just yeah. had 15 credit yeah, cards. Yeah, doubles as a weapon. That's, what, sure. I, that's yeah. what I thought. That's yeah. what I was thinking. But you're talking about using an Apple so, wallet. So, I mean, the things you're going to buy in person frequently, the MX Gold you should have in person. Okay. Because like not every restaurant's going to take that. And if you're traveling overseas, that's a whole other layer because just the way they you know process payments and stuff is different. But otherwise, I mean, that's pretty much it. Yeah, you know, I mean, if you're traveling, yeah, go ahead. I've got, I mean, I talk about 30 cards. I've just got my little little clip. Oh, that goes on the back there. Yeah, but I told you guys, you know, with that, that whole three-card exercise, you know, yeah. what are the three things? Well, the things that I spend the most money on on my every day are in my wallet. Okay, So I don't it. need 30. These are the three or four cards that all my spend got is it. going okay. on. So all those, like I said, that secondary, that supplemental stuff. You know, it's those three cards where all the points earning comes from, and you don't need to carry your Costanza wallet around, and I encourage you not to, but you, know, you can figure out how to effectively use three cards the right way. Um, so, yeah. Just out of curiosity, which card is the most indestructible? Which card do they send you? It's made out of, like, titanium. Dude, oh, the which, Amex Platinum, you could throw that and just, like, chop someone's neck That's off. what I heard. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. That, that's yeah. the one that's the strongest. I think there was some, I think somebody did. There was some kind of reel where, like, they were using the, you know, the metal cards to essentially, like, you know, cut through fruit or something like that. But <laughs> all the, you know, what's cool now is, like, all the good cards, ones that we'd be recommending, you know, they're all... They're yeah, my, my Chase Sapphire you know? Reserve, I could kill someone. Yeah, 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 totally. yeah. Exactly. The thing is hard as shit. So, yeah. and then uh, you know, we're not we're not quite there yet, but there is the you know the MX Black card, the yeah. Centurion card. I would imagine that that one might have a little bit more. Uh, yeah, what's, little, what, little more what's the it? spend to get the Black card? How so it's an invite only thing. Yeah, um, you have to be spending. I think it's at least a million a year, probably. Okay, in, whether it's personally or in your business, but it's a hugely overrated card. The biggest benefit of the Black card is to if impress a, women at dinner. Or depending on what you're, you know, if, yeah. if you sell insurance, something like that, you need to be at the golf course and throwing on the black card yeah. makes you look like the man. Yeah. 
that's your biggest leverage. It's five thousand dollars a year is the annual fee. Wow. And it's not as good for earning points as the other cards are. So like mm -hmm. the flash limits are outrageously higher. Well, like there's what? no limit. There's no there's limit. no limit. Got it. So it's a charge card, right? They have to be like, okay, this person has a high net worth, therefore we can just lend him whatever and we'll pay it back. But um, you, you buy a helicopter with this. That's yeah. what you put the black yeah. card down okay. for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, that's that's pretty amazing. Um, okay, so it, one concept you brought up before about your girlfriend, uh, you, other people you want to fly out. Let's say we have a you know business owner right here. Obviously, it's not going to be a, a business expense. It's going to be a, a personal expense. But flying other people out, you put their name. Now, one of the issues I've had is uh, you fly someone else out, and then all of a sudden they cancel the trip, but the, the ticket's in their name, so it's like transferable back to them, so it becomes kind of an issue there. Is there a trick uh, when it comes to this as far as like flying other people out? Yeah, yeah, great, great uh, question here too. So in terms of, you know, another powerful piece to using the points where it really provides us like the ultimate flexibility. So as you mentioned, like, hey, you know, I booked flights paying cash where, and trust me, I've had this as well, where all of a sudden, you know, our passenger, we canceled the flight. Well, now I've got, you know, whoever, she, someone's got a $700 flight, you know, future flight credit that yeah, I people can't use it, myself. It's, and I can't use it again. Right. That's mm -hmm. the part that's so good. It's, like, it's like somehow the travel credit is some sort of national security issue. Yeah. Like, why can't I, you, I paid for this. Why can't I have it back? It's, it's like buying a car for your son and then your son doesn't want it, but I can't drive it. I don't understand. Yeah. I bought the car. Yeah. So, I mean, things happen, things, plans change, you know, things come up, but that's something you want to avoid where it's like, Hey, I bought this for somebody else, but now I can't use it. Now I'm stuck without, yeah. without it. So we want to avoid that. With the points, let's just say this, points can be used for anybody. And a lot of people are like, oh, you know, do I transfer my points to that person or how do I do this? No, I mean, you literally, you go find the flight, you enter in the passenger details of whoever's flying and you're good to go. And let's say, okay, you know, crap, did we cancel the trip or something come up? We cancel the flight, miles post back in our account and these miles can be used for anybody or anything. Okay, so is you know it's it's rough getting cash back from a, an airline. Usually they're just going to give mm -hmm. you a credit. I'm probably mm -hmm. wasted thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. and it, they give me a a number that I never end up using on an airline that I've totally forgotten about. I have to write all these things down. In this case, I'm going to get all my points back. Okay, that's exactly. That's, that's a so pretty it huge gives benefit. you the ultimate flexibility of okay. um, like I said, not only being able to use them for anybody, but being able to change and modify it. Because I mean, yeah, things happen. So it's like. It just solves a huge problem or potential problem by having that as a, an option. Um, for, you guys mentioned there were some things that happened during COVID that were different. Uh, when you guys were during that period where the chat here in Vegas, just to let you know, we were partying. This I know <laughs> they said the city closed. It didn't close. We were just having mansion sure. parties every night. The wildest parties. We had photo shoots all the time. It was crazy. Uh, but now, like if you try to do a mansion party in Vegas, it's a little harder because all the clubs are open mm -hmm. again. What was different for you, like guys, during that period of time, um, as far as your uh, ability to book stuff for, for clients or yourself or hotels sure. cheaper? Like, what was the difference then? Yeah, I mean, it was a huge time for people that were interested and willing to travel. Like for us, we our brands were still building. Like the Instagrams hadn't taken off yet, all that stuff. So it was an awesome time to capture content because the availability to use points mm -hmm. for epic shit that would normally cost way more it was just like 10x availability right now you jump through the hoops like i would go from miami which was you know i was like a conference down there it's like 200 people and everyone's hanging out and then i would show up in hawaii and it was like you couldn't even go on the beach mm. and so you'd see the contrast that was that was wild but from a point standpoint you would find unbelievable deals for things that like are usually very difficult or very expensive even in points terms to be able to book so that was both of us for that period was actually how our brands blew up because we were leveraging a lot of that opportunity to be like, let's get the best content we can. And then we use that too. So I think that was probably for me, at least the biggest thing. I don't know if you had anything different on that. Yeah, but it was pretty similar, you know, during you know the middle of COVID, that's when we kind of just started up, you know, we were doing our own things individually, but that's when we kind of when we started our businesses. So yeah, there wasn't a lot of like demand for travel and stuff, but we were going out and, you know, doing our things. So yeah, the ability to get some of these very, um, aspirational type first class flights these crazy hotels where not only was it available but it was also able to be booked at an insane rate like going back to the airline status like i was getting upgraded every freaking flight because nobody was flying but then oh, ultimately wow. yeah so that was a piece too but then ultimately what happened with us is you know that aid that gave us time to you know build our brands get our business get our get our offers dialed in so that all of a sudden well you know hey world's open again this pent up demand for travel um, was huge, but that also made it 10 times more difficult. Um, people are like, oh, you know, I saw you do this, I saw you do that. Like, how can I do that? I'm like, well, we can do it, but 
I need you to, tr like, this is how, this is how it's going to work. I need you to trust me on that. It's not quite as easy, but you know, at the end of the day, we want people traveling. There's going to be more flights. There's going to be more hotels. So at the end of the day, like that's, that's good. We want that, but that's makes the strategy behind all of this stuff, all that more important uh, to be able to actually get to that final piece of the puzzle. And that is, Hey, I earned all these points. I got to use them for an epic travel experience. You know what it reminds me of is like comps here in Vegas. Uh, if you if you show up to a club with you got like ten girls with you, they're gonna give you like a back the like table off in the back because you're not paying any money for it. But if nobody sets their table, then they put you on the dance floor. That's what it kind of seems like mm -hmm. to me. During COVID, if you did it, you're right. right. Yeah. We were, oh, yeah. They were putting us on the dance floor because the clubs were open. We just had they had like these boundaries in between sure. them at the mm -hmm. point. But that's what it reminds me of. It's like they're gonna put the, they they don't want not only they. They don't want you to see dance floor tables empty. And airlines, I'm sure, don't want you to see their airlines empty mm -hmm. as well. So I, I mm -hmm. can see it kind of being something similar. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned something. Uh, if you're open and flexible, you can save money. So is there something mm -hmm. to do with that where it's like it's not a specific day you want to travel, but you're willing to to, to be flexible? Yeah, I mean, and this, this really comes down to specifically... You know, we're working with a lot of business owners where, you know, you're not necessarily going to have five days of flexibility to get to Dallas, right? It's like that flight, you should just book the one you can book 21 yeah. days out, follow your protocol, simple flight, book it. If you're going to Bali and you're going to be doing an epic first class trip and it's an awesome experience and you have three or four days where you could say, okay, I could leave Monday or I could leave Friday, you know, as long as we're there for two weeks in June, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Then that gives you a lot of options to get better deals. And particularly it's called positioning flights. You live in Vegas. There's not going to be a lot of great flights to Asia directly from Vegas. There's mm -hmm. some, but the best thing is if you're going to be able to go to San Francisco, LA, Seattle, Vancouver, then you're going to be able to get better flights there. So if you have a little bit of flexibility for those big, particularly the big international flights, you're going to find way better options, way better deals. How do I know when this opportunity arises? Am I checking every day like a stock portfolio? Like what? Yeah, is I mean, that's that's the part where it's like, yeah, this becomes daunting if you're going to do it on your own. There are some some apps and tools and softwares that do it. We always recommend if you're a business owner, like this is where your assistant should come in mm. and you should either get them trained up or have them do this for you. This is what we do for people because that's the that's the the part where the money is made, but you don't really want to spend that time every day refreshing apps and loading new seat availability on, a, on an airline site. I mean, it's a waste of time for you. It's interesting. Uh, for some people, you know, they, they like to play video games or gamify different parts of their life. But like after meeting, you know, Justin, mm -hmm. it's like this is a game for him. This His hobby is like getting into lounges he's not supposed <laughs> to get into. His hobby is getting into first class, getting upgraded in first class when he's not supposed to. Like that is his thing. Um, that's one of the things I teach in my program is you need to be able to talk your way into something you're not supposed to be in. Mm -hmm. And like like Justin Rossley is probably the best example I've mm -hmm, ever seen yep. of anybody being like that. So it's really interesting when you guys talk about that. What um, uh, You mentioned before, if somebody's already in debt, they shouldn't go down this road. You, can you go more into that? Well, I would say, I mean, there's consumer debt and then business debt, right? Yeah. If you're leveraging debt strategically to grow your business, that might not be a bad thing. Consumer yeah. debt would be very different in that. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you're not able to treat your credit cards like they're a debit card, at least to some extent, and have that reined in, getting more cards is generally not going to be a good recipe. I mean, if, you're, if you can't manage what you currently have, getting more you can't. If you can't pay off the balance at the beginning of every month, then you probably shouldn't be doing this. Correct. Right? So you yeah. guys remember the Hermosis had five cards and they ran each one of them up to 10K to, for 50000 Like that, you, if you're in that position, that you should not be trying to do this travel mm -hmm. hack thing. I would say, yeah, the only difference is if it's a business card and you're like intentionally like, hey, I want to invest in Michael's program. This is yeah. going to help me grow in certain ways. It's at 0% interest. I have a year to pay that back. It's not impacting my credit. Oh, got it. Okay. That is like a strategic way to leverage it. Like I did that when I first started this because I had another company. It's like, I don't have time to build this whole thing. So I joined a coaching program. They gave me an assistant in that. So I used a little bit of 0% interest business credit to use that as leverage to get into the program and get an assistant that helped me take this off. Um, the, this is probably a really basic question. So 0% interest for a year. Yes. So we, so generally when I have a consumer or when I have a, a personal card, what I'm going to be charged interest every month if I go past the, the, the next day off. But you're saying for a business card, there's certain things I can put off for a year. Can I do that with a personal card also? Or how does that work? There, so there are 0% offers for both personal and business. The uh -huh. reason the business cards are better is because if you, let's say you get a $10,000 personal card and you max it out, now your personal credit is impacted, which is bad. Yeah. If you get a 0% interest business card, because it's a business card, you can max it out and it's not going to impact your personal credit. Got it. Okay. So that's the difference maker, right? Now, after that first year, it's probably going to jump to, yeah, like a 23% APR, which you obviously don't want. Yeah. So that's where you need to have a plan to actually think like, how am I going to pay this down? Do I have the cash on hand? I just don't want to sell my stocks or whatever it is that you have in investments. Like you want to know what you're doing with that. Yeah. But that's, that's the play. 
Um, someone asked you this question. I forgot which which uh, lady. It was a lady who asked this, and it was a great question. I'm going to ask you this to you again. <laughs> you are traveling with your girlfriend, and one of you gets the upgrade. Who is it that that goes uh, uh, first class? Yeah, so this is a good one. So the way I like to look at it is... Y your answer um, is different from mine, by the way. <laughs> well... <laughs> Let's just this. If you're going, let's just say you're going on a two week trip yeah. with somebody, maybe things are already in a good place. Maybe we're trying to get them in a good place. Yeah. Well, I couldn't think of a worse way to start a two week trip with somebody with her sitting in the back. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, okay. So you, you and if, I are on the same page. If here. it came down to it, yeah. On the way there, if it was me or her, I would, I would give her the seat under the, uh, We'd be sharing in some way, shape, or form. But hey, yeah. let me come up, have a few drinks, so I can, you know, take the edge off. For sure. But starting the trip, oh yeah, I'll, I'll I'll give that. On the way home, who knows? You're gonna swap it. <laughs> That's hilarious. My, my answer is honestly, this is what I've thought about this situation yeah. a couple of times. I would honestly go up to someone else in the flight that's probably never flown first class, be like, I'm upgrading you, and we're both sitting in economy. Yeah. Because at least then you're like you're riding together, and it's not this like. Yeah, so that's that. Mo for 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 me, I wouldn't do it. That would just like stay for us stay together. But yeah, it would be her before me. Uh, also, because I'm just used to such austere, horrible flying conditions. Sure. It is. I'm not kidding, guys. It's sometimes like 27 degrees inside of a KC 135. If you're out back in the boom pod, your head because there's no air pressure, your head is like 105 degrees because the heater comes straight off the. Um, uh, a lot of people don't understand. There's not internal heaters in an airplane. They it, it comes straight off the heat, the engine heat. And the cold doesn't come from an air compressor. The cold comes from outside ambient air that's negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. But they get to mix it in the airplane. In a, in a, a, a 1957 KC-135, there's no mixing. Your feet are at 25 degrees and your head is at 105 degrees. It is the craziest. You can lay on the ground and you're freezing and then you stand up and you're like, what in the hell is going on? It's the wow. weirdest thing <laughs> I ever. Know that. It's pretty crazy. Um, so uh, the other, the other uh, thing that you guys were talking about was um, traveling with children. Or traveling first class, um, is it? If you were traveling with children, would you even consider doing first class, or do you think it's just something like how, how would you guys handle that whole deal? We have a lot of clients that ask this question, right? And there's there's some people like hell no, kids sit in the back. I mean, it depends on their age. Yeah. Some people have a nanny. That's the ultimate hack is if you just have someone that can just go back with the kids and yeah. take care of them ideally. Um, but uh, but most of the folks end up honestly, most of them for the long flights, they end up doing it. For the shorter flights, I think they typically go to the back. I that's what I've seen. I mean, you've handled more of the client bookings on that. What are you, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, you know, well, you know, if we're talking to, I mean, the more passengers traveling in general, you know, yeah. it's also the harder it is to get some of these flights booked. So we yes. start talking families of four, family, like two people, I can do that all day. Four, six. So, you know, ideally, yeah, in my perfect scenario, if and when the kids come along, so hopefully the money's there too, where I've got, I got nanny in the back, kids are doing good. I'm up front or ideally, you know, maybe I show, show my kids what it's all about up in first class, but say, Hey, you know, if you want to ride up front with dad, um, get, get your homework done. Did you do this? Like, there's gotta be some incentive for them to, uh, you know, earn that right to kind of be up there. Cause, uh, I mean, I've done hundreds of thousands of miles in the back and you know, junior's gotta, junior's gotta earn that seat in, in, uh, in my opinion. What, what are you doing? Um, Within this situation, yeah. I don't have any kids. Um, I probably we all just sit in the economy and I give them an iPad. That's yep. kind of what it seems like to me. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Like kind of buy them some candy inside the shop and give them an iPad. Uh, so uh, do you guys have any, when it comes to this, so like for me, my hacks for traveling is um, I usually have a MacBook. I'll download a couple of movies beforehand uh, or YouTube. I have YouTube Plus and I'll download all the things on YouTube Plus. I use my AirPods, the noise canceling. Is there any hacks that you guys have for traveling that you would tell other people that, to not? Because to me, it's like I'm so involved in whatever movie I'm watching that I don't care about the fact that my knees are up in my shoulders. Like I just, you know, it doesn't issue me. It's not a big issue to me. Do you guys have any hacks that you do in particular? I, Bose, head, Bose headsets or anything? I mean, like? I love Bo Bose and yeah. AirPods are great. Um, the over ear ones, sometimes yeah. I like to switch because like if it's a really long flight, it's almost like it's irritating after a while. Yeah. But, uh, Honestly, I love working on flights for the most part. Okay. I just feel like there's something about you're disconnected. I'll intentionally a lot of times mm -hmm. not buy Wi-Fi and just like lock in and I'm doing some long form copy or whatever. It's like strategic oh, planning. It. Okay. Yeah. Because no one can distract you. And there's something about just like looking out, seeing horizon where it's like you get this like perspective type stuff. So I tend to do that. Um, there's this trend called slammer time where you take champagne, and you just chug it on. Uh, and that's been <laughs> something that's gone viral. Yeah. So there's usually a couple, have a couple slammers yeah. zone in on work. I tend to do that or read. Um, I'm usually trying to do stuff that like requires a little more disconnection. That's at least 
that's my my general take. But you you save it for that. Like a week, my girlfriend and I will save movies for flights. Yeah, specifically. Nice. Is there yeah. anything you do? Yeah, I mean, so I did 114 flights last year. Yeah, uh, I think I spent. I think it was literally. I think I spent five percent of my entire year like on an airplane last year. Wow. So. You know, one is obviously I'm getting content. I'm flying some insanely epic, you know, there's bars on the plane. I'm drinking $300 champagne. Like, so obviously I'm trying to a, enjoy it a little bit too, but I'm taking videos, I'm doing content. Um, and it's a long, I mean, I've had long, long, long travel days, but also kind of like what Eli said, it's like, that's kind of my time where nobody can really, but you know, I don't have Zoom calls. I don't have this going on. So it's kind of like, it's almost a nice little time to kind of disconnect where, hey, yeah, obviously I want to enjoy the flight. I want to, you know, drink all the champagne. I want to have the caviar. I want to, you know, just kind of just do like I said, just enjoy it. But then also the ability to kind of get some of that work done where you're completely uninterrupted, um, you know, and have maybe have a little champagne along the way with it. But in terms of hacks, if I'm going on a flight to go have fun, you know, getting a little bit older, my pregame now is making sure that I'm hydrated. I've eaten. And so, so this is what I wanted. So I stretch. I actually go and do mm. like a long stretch before I go fly. I'm mm. just like years on that airplane, like 11 hour flights. Like the thing was brutal for a while, but uh, not, the, the cut, uh, seats are not very comfortable. Um, I do a like long stretch and I and I mm. drink a bunch. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I would do it full even when I was in the military. I would stretch. I would literally like do start stretching before I even climbed up in the cockpit. Yeah. Um, so that was one. And then like you said, the hydration or whatever. Mm -hmm. You got like coffee, caffeine, anything. Is there anything in particular to do? You guys take Dramamine, anything like that? There's actually a really cool product that's out. Another guy who started. It's called Flykit. Okay. And it's specifically an anti jet lag protocol. Okay. So they give you the blue light blockers. Yeah. They give you um, certain whether it's vitamin D, certain things for helping you to like your body to adjust if you're changing time zones a lot. Mm. And then they have like a caffeine protocol to get you back uh, dialed in. Um, and then I think there's like some fish oil supplements or something in there too. But the kit has everything you need. And then if you're flying from like time zone A to time zone B in Europe, you load it in the app and it will tell you when to take everything. Mm. And so this is the best, like if you're flying long haul overnight. It's like an aura ring, but it's for flying. It's yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's like a specific, they give you the, pa like you get it in the mail. Uh -huh. and you have the pack, yeah. they have like compression socks for blood circulation. Like they got the thing. Compression socks, yeah, that's something yeah. we use before. Yeah, yeah well, except he's a former military guy. Yeah, um, yeah really cool dude. Um, so there's that. And then, yeah, I, I don't know the last time I flew where I didn't get a workout before. Like if I don't move my body beforehand, I'm just like antsy on the plane no matter so what. So if you if you switch like four or five time zones, do you get off? Like this is what I've been doing. I get off and then I go to cardio. Yeah. Like I'm gonna, it, does that help? Yeah. That helps pretty Yeah, so, I mean, I, cardio for me too, but I some form of movement is huge in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think my biggest thing in terms of um, kind of just like sticking on the jet lag. Yeah. Where, A, you know, I think I went through 25 or 30 countries last year where I was never at one time zone necessarily long enough to like even be you know, fully in a, in a routine, but my biggest hack for at least, um, you know, when you're landing, wherever that is, whenever it is, is, you know, do not take a nap. You want yeah, to stay, yeah, yeah, up, for sure. stay up until mm -hmm. that sun goes down. If you can make it to eight o'clock at night, I mean, you might've flown 12 hours and you might've landed at 8 a.m. You take that nap when you land or in the afternoon, you're going to be up spinning, you're going to be twisted. So you kind of got to just push yourself or I've had those, you know, 36 hour 48 hour travel days of just insanity, but I push through so that you, when you fall asleep that night, trust me, you hit the pillow and you're out. But I'm also not waking up at two or three in the morning. I, I was so damn exhausted that yeah. I was able to sleep through and you, you know, you can almost, you, know, you almost kind of reset yourself yeah. in a day. And then obviously, you know, I fly like Justin sometimes and I've, I've been a little, uh, little, little hungover on uh, some of those landings and stuff like that. But the fact that you can have that, that first night is like super crucial in my opinion, to be able to like reset yourself. Nice. One other thing, I mean, you were touching about that kind of travel routine. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, I mean, we're in the travel business, but I think it depends on your, your line of work, your industry and, and how important connections are, but the lounge and the flight, <clears throat> the amount of awesome business connections I've made through those experiences. Oh, alone, wow. Yeah. Phenomenal. I mean, Justin, I think it was Justin, or maybe someone else who would go work from, because there was, there's ways you can kind of like hack the lounges where you can just like not fly or change your ticket. We're talking about the lounges in the airports. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for sure. The Centurion but, lounge mm -hmm. and stuff like that. There, yeah. I, whether it was him or someone else would like go work in the lounge every day and just like keep changing their ticket. Mm. And then just use the lounge at the office. They're getting free food, free drinks. All these people are coming Madness. through. They're just like networking all day. Keep changing your ticket Dude, and just stay it, there every day. I mean, imagine if you had like a, a sales I imagine guy. that's what Justin Ross Lee does. He doesn't even get a hotel room. He just yep. sleeps in the couch that's in the, the new office, get a fully refundable oh fare. God. And then it's just, now they've caught on to that a little bit, obviously. Yeah, that's but, um, crazy. There's, like, there's lots of. Not endorsing that. <laughs> there's, like, there's, there's lots of ways to, to, 
lots of different versions of this game. Um, Justin's going to hit me up. Why are you snitching on me, man? Yeah. That's what he's going to say. <laughs> no, but I mean, but the, but the networking piece is huge. I found that to be super cool, whether it was just like fun connections yeah. if you're in a destination or it's like business opportunities. It's like, like when Andrew Tate said, I bought a Bugatti, not just to drive the Bugatti, but now I get to go to Bugatti events mm -hmm. and I meet people who own Bugattis, who are I want, who are the people I want mm -hmm. to do business with. Yeah. It's like the, the car, it's not that the car was $1.3 million. It was that it was a ticket for me to get into a certain group of yep. people to, mm -hmm. to, to work with. So that, that's really yeah, interesting. We were thinking about getting a sales rep and just being like, go sit in the Amex lounge every day, mm -hmm. and fly somewhere yeah. and just talk to people. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, that's, what's really cool. You know, with all these cards and you know, these statuses and these benefits, it's like, you know, I, I hate it, but at the same time, I love walking by and seeing all these people that are just standing in this zigzag line and I'm rolling up with, with TSA, with clear, I'm not waiting in lines. I'm not paying for bags. I'm walking into the lounge. I'm not paying for food where it's kind of like life before jumping into this versus like, wow, how did I even do this any other way? Uh, TSA uh, pre and clear, like are both of those you think worth it? I, I, the clear thing, I, I, I sit there and it seems like they're understaffed and I have to wait a long time for them to check my iris. And then I go, it, it doesn't seem like, I, we tried it one time, my girlfriend did the clear mm -hmm. and I, I did the line and we got there at the same time. But you guys think it's it's worth it to do that? Yeah, I would say generally, and plus like that's one of those things with all these credit cards where one of your credits on these cards and several of them have it is, hey, you've got your TSA, you know, you've got your global entry, you've got your TSA, you've got your clear. So it's basically, it's like, hey, I've got this for free. Might as well use it. So which, which airline? So you're saying these cards will give these you those premium things for free? cards? Yes, yeah. okay. so that's kind of like almost like a standard benefit that you know your Amex Platinums, your Chase Reserve cards. That's those come. I think along Chase Reserve with gave me gave me clear. I think that's what it gave. I'm not I'm not positive. They're they're always changing, but I know the Amex cards in particular. It's 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 clear and TSA, but okay. essentially having both it's like well, why wouldn't you have both because there are going to be lanes where they even have clear and tsa mm -hmm. so it's like if there's a line mm -hmm. obviously i'm skipping the line scanning the eyes not even touching my id and then i'm not taking anything out of my bag so it's like at the end of the day it's just the ultimate convenience or it eliminates all the inconvenience yeah you know, that's the, i mean that's the biggest piece of all is like oh this is annoying oh i don't have to do that anymore oh this is i great. love this country if you're rich enough we don't have to search your stuff yeah right. <laughs> you're not a terrorist you're too rich we're not worried about it have you, you done can... when was the last time you did a tsa interview oh god i can't i don't know if i've ever the, done one. it was ridiculous when i went in they were like okay it was the the questions were insanely it was like are you a terrorist it's like now they're like all right he's good <laughs> it was, it was like, that's like how it felt. It was like, okay. That sounds about I right. was like, I was excited to know that we have these security measures. Yeah. And then after I went through it, I was like, this is concerning. Yeah, well, what was concerning <laughs> to me is that like, you can buy your way through security. Now. Right. Like that's the other yeah. part that was concerning. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, service animals. Uh, the, I remember things got a little out of hand and then all of a sudden the airline started pushing back. People had like service donkeys and service snakes and stuff like that. Uh, what what have you guys found as far as having friends, you know, you guys have any clients who need a, a Yorkshire Terrier to sit in their lap? Yeah, you know, I said the airlines have definitely cracked down in terms of, um, a, you know, can animals be on the plane? And yep. then one is, okay, a, no animals are allowed. And then now it's like, okay, well, you know, only only certified, you know, animals are allowed. There are a few airlines in particular, like, like Air Canada, for example, they have a great policy with allowing pets and including international flights as well. So it doesn't even need to be a service dog. Um, in terms of like our domestic airlines, Last I checked, like you can't fly with a pet on these domestic airlines on these international routes. Um, the service dog level, I, I don't know the exact criteria of each individual airline, but they've tightened it because, like I said, anybody can you know walk on with you know their pet raccoon and say it makes me feel better when I'm I'm with it. Um, so it's got a little ridiculous, but also they still the airlines still do want to provide that because if they say they don't do it anymore, well now they're going to lose not a huge amount of business, yeah. but I want, to, I want to serve his cat. I want to yeah. fly with my cat. Yeah. My, yeah. You actually appreciate this the travel story. Not quite on that, but this was a couple of weeks back. I was flying to, I was doing a Tony Robbins business mastery event. I don't know if you've ever done any of his stuff, but a uh, phenomenal event. I'm going to Jacksonville and I was supposed to take off at 1 PM from Austin. It's a two hour flight. And uh, so I should be getting there by like 5 PM. Flight gets delayed because of weather. No big deal. Whatever. Five o'clock rolls around. We board. I'm sitting there first class. I'm drinking the champagne. I'm doing my work, zoning, listening to music. All of a sudden, I see a gun holster go by my, like right by my face. I'm like, this is not normal part of the protocol. Yeah. Look up. There's six cops on the plane. It's one of these things. Like everyone's got their phone out. They're filming. I'm like, oh shit. Like it's one of those moments. Some dude had made a joke about having a bomb in his bag mm. and we all had to deboard. They had to come in, bring everybody in, search the whole plane. By then the pilots clocked out. So we basically all had to get off 
didn't take off till like 11 p.m. I got into Atlanta at like 3 a.m. Mm. Get to Jacksonville like five hours later. So just in terms of like people doing stupid shit on planes. It's like, like yeah, I got some bomb ass weed. And yeah. It's like, oh, no, we got to search your stuff. I didn't tell my girlfriend because she had yeah. never really traveled uh, uh, international. And she's just like yelling at the people in our group while we're about to go through uh, the uh, customs. And I was like, baby, you need to be quiet. Like, stop. She didn't understand. And like, she's yelling back and forth. Like, you can't do this next to customs. Yeah, they she, don't was, around. she wasn't like understanding that, you know, at, uh, at the time. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So uh, the other one was customer service. Is there a particular card, hotel, an airline that you feel like, oh, I can work with these people, it's very easy, or this is this is mm -hmm. extremely difficult? Mm -hmm. So this will be essentially, let's just say, it's just like you know, getting to skip the lines mm -hmm. and that whole kind of concept. This is where that elite status kind of comes in. You've got status, the airlines, the hotels. Generally, you've kind of got your own line. Mm where you're gonna be able to call this number and you're not gonna be waiting wow. on hold as much, or especially when you're at that upper tier level, you know, you've got it like with Marriott, I've got a personal ambassador that I can just email directly at any time with whatever I need changes, this and that. So I don't ever talk to anybody on the phone there. Now, granted that's for like that top tier, but having that elite status and having that kind of dedicated line, you know, for the customer service piece is huge. Cause at the end of the day, it's, you know, the last thing you want to do is to be on the freaking phone and be on hold. Um, I couldn't say, I would say in general, I mean, they're all going to be, you know, underwhelming when, at the end of the day. So I can't think of any that stick out in particular in terms of like, you know, over the top or, hey, it's, this is way better. But I, I found that's usually the moments where the bank or the program really sucks that you feel that. You don't really notice the great ones. It's like you just feel the, the shitty moments. Mm. So I'd say Amex and Chase, it's like relatively okay. Like you're, it's passable. But typically, I mean, to your point, it's how you book the, the ticket or the hotel and then your status. Like if you fly Lufthansa first class out of Frankfurt, they take you from the first class terminal, which is different from the main terminal mm -hmm. in a private Porsche to the plane. Mm. So it's like you drive onto the tarmac and that's like, I mean, class wow. of service is the key for that. It doesn't matter what your status is or anything. That's because you booked into first class. That's crazy. I was, you know, it made me think of when you said that, um, you guys remember uh, the, we still fly them, but U two aircraft right there. So the pilot, because of the way it's set up, he has a, uh, he's in a pressure suit. He can't see out. So when he lands and he pitches the nose up, he can't see the ground. There's a Corvette where another U2 pilot is behind it calling down 50, 30, 40. But he's racing oh. on the, he's racing on the uh, runway, following him down until he touches down, then he hits the brakes. Crazy. It just made me think about that when you're talking about taking a Porsche from one Crazy. end to another. Because yeah. we, could, we could sit you know, shotgun and watch the pilots land the other planes. It was cool. Cool. That cool. super cool. So it was really weird. I was like, why? I was in Doha, Qatar, and I was like, why are there Corvettes uh, all throughout the, the, on yeah. the on the runway? I was like, yeah, that's the pilots get to land the planes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because you can't see anything. Like, you, yeah. it's, it's not a normal plane. Um, so anyway, uh, just go over all the things we talked about before. There were three cars that you guys mentioned before. It was a, a Capital One, a Chase, and an Amex yes. for personal. Mm -hmm. uh, what were those three again? Yeah, so Chase Sapphire Reserve is yep. the best card for travel. Mm -hmm. Amex Gold is the best card for food. And then the Capital One Venture X is that card for everything, everything else. else. So I'm going to buy electronics and stuff like yep. that. Okay. Shopping, you want to go to Nordstrom's. Um, that's your card. Like I said, if it's not travel, it's not food. Everything else goes on the Capital and One Venture. And you guys don't, you always physically have them. You'll save them on your phone, either through the Apple Wallet or just have them save. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, we talk about you don't mit, you try to not mix business expenses with uh, personal expenses. You don't try to commingle those. And that's for like tax reasons. Yeah, tax reasons. <clears throat> the banks don't really want you to do that anyways. And then you're going to earn that multiplier on business categories. So like, do you spend a lot on ads, social media ads, mm -hmm. right? To generate leads. There's going to be business cards that have a 4X multiple on that. No, no, no personal card does. Oh, wow. So that's you want to have. That's something we'd be very interested in. Is there a, oh, yeah, what, yeah. what card, what card gives you 4X for a. MX ad. business, MX business gold. Okay. So you'll earn 4X points on advertising up to your first $150,000 a year in okay. spend. Let's just say you're doing 1.5 million in spend. Yeah. Let's just say you can add layers to that where you could capture up to 1.5 million in spend at 4X points each. Wow. Which is. But those are not points that uh, we can use personally. Okay, got no, it. No, they, they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, no, you can. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah, so that's why you want to have those business cards as separate from the personal ones as okay. well. Those bonus categories and then the tax benefits. Like just to yeah. frame that out, like let's say you had 150,000 in ad spend. Yeah. You used your Amex business gold. That's going to net me or net you 600,000 American Express points. That's enough American Express points for me to basically say, Michael, tell me where you want to go in the world. And that's going to cover two people round trip business or first class. 
where that, that could be twenty twenty five thousand dollars when it's all said and done. So you took one hundred and fifty thousand in ad spend, mm. ma- maximized your earnings, and if you have some help, we can take that and get a twenty five thousand dollar return on our spend. So you know you're looking at almost fifteen twenty percent back when it's when it's all said and done. Awesome. And then the other thing you guys said was. Uh, yeah, low, lower utilization, so this can help your credit. Mm-hmm. You know, ha- having those three cards yep. and then paying them off, obviously on time. Don't don't run this thing up because now you're paying interest, which mm-hmm. kind of negates all the the, mm-hmm. the thing you get from points. Don't go through the portal. Instead, uh, have a loyalty program with each one of the airlines and the hotels, so that you can mm-hmm. you can use their point system. Uh, and then being flexible, awesome man. Um, is there anything else um, you guys have coming up with your business? Can you describe how somebody would get in touch with you for for your business? What exactly do you guys offer? Yeah, so we have different levels of service and mentorship in this. Mm-hmm. We have done for you service where we're working with you know multiple eight figure business centers, and they're like, I want you guys to be our concierge. Are you guys doing Zoom calls? Like how 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 are you doing? We coaching? have a private chat. Okay. So we want to make it a, like just like if you were had an accounting, mm-hmm. you know, working with an accountant, you want to be seamless, right? You don't yeah. want to be thinking about like what's going on here. So you can think of our company. It's like if a there's like a CPA for your credit cards, mm-hmm. Met Travel Advisor, Met Points Geek. It's all in one. So we optimize your card spend. We do all that for you. We map out the cards. We then help you actually redeem your points for travel. So we have mm-hmm. a service level where we do that for people. And then we have one where we more guide through it. And it's more of a done with you where we're going to like teach you, coach you, mentor you. Yeah. And so we have both of those. Um, but the best way to get in touch is just freedomtravelsystems.com. People can book a call um, around there. It's a complimentary call or hit us up on Instagram. Either one of our profiles is travel like Tommy and Eli travel guy. Just say you heard us on Sartain's podcast and okay. uh, we'll give him a, a free complimentary call too. That's amazing, man. Awesome. This is really, I mean, I was uh, a little concerned. I was like, cause I don't know that much about this, but this has been great. Like there's so much, and I, I tell you right now, my two business partners are going to watch this and be like, holy shit, that's a lot of stuff that we needed to learn. Cause you think of it as like, oh no, that's just what rich people do to go travel. Mm-hmm. And like, and then when you, when you start running a business and you have to do this all the time, you start to realize that this is a significant, it's almost like a taxation on your business yes. and you're avoiding taxes. Mm-hmm. This is almost kind of the same kind of situation. You nailed it. The way that we like to say this is like, you are already spending money every day. Yes. Right. It's just like, if you get better with your taxes, you can increase your profit in your company without having to re-strategize your marketing plan, like any of that stuff. You're just being more efficient with your expenses. The same thing. You just change a couple cards on what you spend on and then how you use your points and you get all these bucket list experiences or upgrades and stuff like that. Or you can gift it to people too. So you're already doing the hardest part. So that's, that's really the key. I love it, man. And one more time, where, where can we find each one of you guys? Uh, travel like Tommy. Eli Travel Guy. Okay, awesome, man. Well, thank you guys for coming out. This is really great. I, I hope to put some of this to, to use. Hopefully you guys will come out here to Vegas again uh, during the during bikini season. It's a, it's a lot of fun here. <laughs> That's why I don't try. Honestly, I moved to Vegas, so I don't travel that much. Like everyone comes and visits me twice a year. Okay. I was like, does my mom want to go visit me when I'm stationed at McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita, Kansas, or on the strip in Las Vegas? That's the ultimate travel hack right yeah. there. Yeah. The ultimate yeah. travel hack is to live in Las Vegas. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us, man. This is really great. I know it was a very different direction that we went, but uh, this was pretty awesome. Uh, and we will see all of you guys next week. Thank you.